or to take those photos at the particular point. And of course, if you have to come up the most defining moments in the struggle of South Africa, you would have that. Whilst there were at a time others thought that the only weapon and instrument we have at our disposal was AK-47. Hence they crossed the Limpopo, went to different parts of the world. He used lens as his AK-47. Little did we know at that time that not only a stone was the only element and instrument we have, but a lens can do so much to expose the brutality, the injustices that was meted against the majority of people in South Africa. He has gone through a lot and we thank him so much. Whilst it's the moment of sadness to send him a dignified send off today, but it's a moment of celebration of such a selfless contribution using a lens, telling the story. And I think it is such stories that must be documented. Recently, I had a conversation with people of his, uh, of his ilk that there are moments in South Africa that we need to document, including the moment where we won the World Cup. There was something that was happening in the country at that moment. And I think that moment must be filmed, that moment, there must be good pictures of that moment, there must be documentaries, there must be telenovelas about those moments, there must be music about those moments. And I think people like him will be missed, but I'm sure he has left a lot in the industry who came from his hands. So it's truly a moment to celebrate. Quite significant because it was his images and the images of his colleagues uh, that were beamed across the world and that's where we saw international solidarity for black people in South Africa who this violence was being meted out against. When we talk about liberation struggle, it means they were all people in South Africa participated. In other words, mass internal resistance, you had people like him, you had those who believed that they were throwing stones, you had people who use songs, dance, you had people who, like Chico, who produced, were very professed in their songs with Brenda Fassi, my black president. You had people like uh, Mungen Ngema, uh, freedom is coming. So there's a lot of different sectors that played in particular role to our liberation. And that's why we must always appreciate that our freedom came through the resistance of the old people in South Africa. Minister, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, the atrocities that were meted out by the apartheid government against black people in South Africa during a very dark time in this country. Former President uh, Tabombeki has also arrived uh, at the funeral service also uh, to pay his respects as well, alongside with the family. Since uh, we heard of his passing, many spoke about this uh, a journalistic giant, uh, this man who used uh, his tool. As I've been saying throughout the course of this morning, uh, many people took up arms uh, during the apartheid regime to fight against the brutality of apartheid but you had a man the likes of Dr. Peter Makubane and others who used the tools that they had at the time and in this instance it was a camera those images fostering international solidarity for the plight of black people in South Africa during apartheid. We're expecting uh, the proceedings to get underway any minute now but I tell you many people from the arts from government uh, politicians. We've also got the Gauteng Premier, uh, who is also here, Banyaza Lasufi, also uh, to pay homage. The cortege has already arrived at the church now, ahead of the start of this service. But let's take a listen to what one of the veterans in the arts, Dr. John Ghani, had to say in paying tribute to Dr. Peter Makubane. Let's take a listen. Days in detention. We survived assassinations. And when we look today and look at the plight of our people as a whole, you almost want to question, is this what Magubana put a camera in a loaf of bread and risked? Is it what Magubana did when the cops were dragging these young children and took those pictures as a record that they have him? That's what is work. This is what we survived. It's because as the cops were arresting us and throwing us into police van, taking us into detention, someone took a picture. I remember on the 23rd day in detention, a piece of paper came under the cell. It was a picture of me and Winston. And the demonstrations in London, all over the world, released John Khan. Without that one person taking that picture, I could have been easily died in that cell. So today, as I say again, 
here's another warrior. Here's another MK cultural soldier. We're putting the flowers this time on his grave. But death has no victory over Makuban because his name lives forever. We are here, look at the many people that are here to celebrate his life. And death had thought that it silenced him. Never, not us, not the artist. Well, as I indicated, the program expected to start any minute now. The cortege, having already arrived here at the Bryanston Methodist Church, and uh, one of those who's also in attendance here this morning, also from the arts, is uh, Mamu Abigail Kubeka, who also uh, highlighted the significance of the work that Dr. Peter Makobani did in highlighting the plight of uh, South Africans uh, under the helm of the apartheid government. Let's take a listen to what Mum Abigail Kubeka had to say. Great loss. You know, he saved us. He saved the world. But he's not gone. He's still with us because his work, what he fought for, what he did, is still here and we cherish it. And uh, I'm so happy at the, at the memorial, some of, some of the guys were talking about him and they were saying they were picking up the baton, which is wonderful. So, to the family, to the world, to South Africa, to the world, my condolences. So had it not been for the images uh, that were beamed throughout the world, of course, uh, shot by the likes of Dr. Peter Makubane and his other colleagues uh, like uh, Alf Kumalo and many others uh, who during very difficult times captured those images of the brutality of uh, the apartheid state. Uh, the international community would not have got to see exactly what was taking place in South Africa at the time. You would recall, of course, the caliber of man who is being celebrated here today, uh, also having been arrested and detained multiple times, spending hundreds of days in solitary confinement, often clashing with apartheid police, uh, standing truth to power at the particular time. I recall just one of the references that have been made is at a time where he was arrested while he was capturing the images of a demonstration outside the cell of Mama, Winnie Matigizela Mandela, just one of the instances where, you'd recall of course, we spoke about instances where he'd been shot 17 times with rubber bullets while also trying to capture uh, images at the funeral service of a youth activist. So of the many times that he did his work, there was no fear. They say that Dr. Peter Makubane refused to leave the country. He wanted to tell the truth of what was uh, taking place in South Africa. So I think at this time, as the cortege makes its way, the remains of uh, Dr. Peter Makubane make their way inside uh, the church here at the Bryanston Methodist Church. Many will be here to pay tribute and uh, to pay homage to a man who used his lens. That was his power. While many took up arms, he used his camera as a weapon to capture the atrocities of what was taking place at the time. He was gifted uh, with his camera we understand it was a, a, a modest codec brownie, we understand, by his father when he was a teenager. And after completing high school, Dr. Makubane was eager to put his camera to use. You would know, of course, that uh, he found work as a driver at, uh, you know, the iconic in its own way drum magazine offices. This was about in 1954 and basically moved up the ranks. Uh, to a dark room assistant and uh, basically that was where this journey had begun for Dr. Peter Makubane. President Cyril um, Ramaphosa expected in that eulogy to touch on the celebration of this globally renowned photographer who documented, as I said, these critical moments, um, you know, in South Africa's liberation struggle, and of course the emergence of democracy, having passed away on the 1st of January this year at the age of 90.
one. He was also, uh, you would know, a distinguished member of the National Order of Lutuli. And um, this uh, provincial official funeral category too, you would know, includes uh, elements of um, a police ceremonial honours and is reserved for distinguished persons specifically designated, of course, by President of South Africa on the request of the Premier of the province. In this case, uh, Banyaza de Sufi, who is, of course, the Premier of the province. Using his camera to document and record, just have a moment of silence as uh, the clergy makes their way in.
while we are still standing, let me first thank Reverend Buitumelo Mahalemele, who is the resident pastor of this parish, and also thank the Reverend Sva Waku of the Methodist Church in Bedford View. We are going to remain standing for the singing of the national anthem. And after the national anthem is sung or rendered, I will then invite Bishop Malusi Mpumlwana, the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, to come forward to the pulpit to lead us in the opening prayer. We shall start with the national anthem, then over to you, Bishop, after that. God, our divine parent, by raising Christ your son, you destroyed the power of death and opened for us the way to eternal life. As we remember before you, our brother Peter Magubane, we ask your help for all who gather here today to mourn together his departure. Grant us the assurance of your presence and grace by the spirit you have given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Mpumlwana. As we take our seats, we shall have a rendition of the song, Di Kokele O Yehovah. Oh, 
is the Methodist church and the Methodists must have been wondering. Thank you. His Excellency the President of the Republic of South Africa Mr. Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa His Excellency President Thabo Mbeki, the Premier of Gauteng, the Honorable Panyaza Lesufi, the family of Magubani, Ambassador Magubani, my sister Fikile the brother Linda, the entire family, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, members of the media family, Peter Magubani's family, members of the clergy, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome this morning to this occasion when we bid farewell to one of the stalwarts, to one of the giants of our country. My name is Phil Molefe. I am your program director this morning. We do not have much time at our disposal. We have to be out of here at 11.50 or just thereabouts. Also because of the dictates of weather we would like to get to the cemetery before the heavy downpour. Well, this is a very big ship to steer. Hence, there is a co-pilot to assist me in directing the proceedings. And I am indeed grateful this morning that uh, I am joined as program director by the Minister of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, the Honorable Zizi Kodwa. The Minister will also be directing the service together with me this morning. 
owing to a very tight time schedule, we are going to try and keep renditions and tributes to a very limited time just by way of opening remarks at the end of which I will invite Minister Zizi Kotoa also to greet and to make his opening remarks mindful of this occasion and also mindful of the great service to his nation, David the Psalmist writes in one of his thanksgiving songs and he writes, the Lord has emboldened me to run through troops, navigating my way out of the armed enemy camp. Yes, my God has empowered me to leap over walls and hurdles that the enemy had put before me. David writes this song as a song of thanksgiving and praise after he had been saved from his enemies and had been through battles in his life. Indeed, this is the life of Dr. Peter Sexford Magubani. In the true sense of the word, he ran through barricades of security forces, dived and ducked bullets, and he survived it all. And the Lord empowered him to even leap over walls that enemies from all fronts had set before him. Some came from within and some from the identified zone. He was detained he was tortured, he was arrested countless times, and at one stage his house was petrol bombed. And like a wanderer, he was all over the world seeking refuge because his own home country had become a battlefield. He covered it all, through it all. It is Peter Magubane who took that famous picture of a policeman and a youngster who held onto a lead of a dustbin to ward off the bullets. It's Peter Magubane who would hide his camera in a loaf of bread and sneak through a human wall of police and not only capture the story of South Africa, but document its history. Today, we bid farewell. We salute one of South Africa's greatest, Peter Magobani, who we fondly called Bra Peter or Bra Pedro. May his soul rest in peace. I am now going to invite the minister to step forward to greet 
and to make the opening remarks and we will continue with our program bearing in mind that uh, you have the program before you so prepare yourself if you have an item to render. Minister Godwa, over to you. Fellow program director, the clergy, Bishop Mpumlwana, former president Thabo Mvelo Mbeki, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa, the Premier of Gauteng, to the family of Makubane, Onkomose Ochiane Otole. Thank you for the opportunity, this rare privilege, to program direct as we bid farewell to Umkulu. Thank you to Ambassador Fikile Makubane Nabantuan for this rare privilege. As my fellow program director indicated, we're here not just to, to honor but to celebrate, to celebrate a struggle icon, a veteran of our struggle and a veteran of the liberation struggle who used an instrument, not an AK, but lens to expose the brutality and injustices meted against his own people. May we today celebrate this moment. I thank so many photographers and journalists who have gathered here today, many of whom are products of Mkulu. I see among us the greatest from a journalism point of view. Tata Snuki Zikalala, Tata Chowtlowe, and many others. Abakona Pakati Kwetu, like in Tatema Tata Zedu. These are the people who steered the ship and told stories during the most difficult times. President of the Republic, you were a student at a time when Mkulu took his famous pictures. And I'm sure you'll recall some of the pictures he took whilst we were a student. Let us celebrate this moment. It is indeed an honor for me and a privilege to direct this program on behalf of the family. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let us pray. Loving God, author of life and fountain of grace, we thank and honor you for Peter's life that we come to celebrate today. We bless you for all he has achieved and for the, resi the resilience and the discipline of hard work that he has sustained, a pattern that many will happily seek to embrace for the next generations. In gratitude for his life, we come to commend his soul to your immeasurable grace. We ask your grace for all his beloved ones, for whom he will now transition to the chambers of fond memory. He goes to his forebears and goes in peace, that he may leave that peace behind him, where he has erred in any way in his life, in your grace grant pardon, we pray, where he has needed to reconcile in your grace occasion that on his behalf and make this final celebration of his life designed as a statement of love to be the pool of healing for all that with his soul soaked in your love his place in the lives of his family may be filled by a fragrance of contentment we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord the liturgy of the word. We now receive our first reading from 
1 Peter chapter 4 verses 7 to 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone saves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Our second scripture reading is taken in the New Testament, the Gospel according to Luke chapter 24. We commence our reading from verse 1 to verse 12. And I read from the NIV version, and the title says, The Resurrection of Jesus. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified on the third day, rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning to the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths, by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearing this morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. May I meditate with you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. This is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. To the Magubane family, please accept our condolences for this loss. Yet we make bold to ask you to let this great congregation of Peter Magubane's admirers to have a small share in celebrating this great human being, a model from which to cut a life pattern. Our text is an extract from the first reading we had this morning from 1 Peter. The reading opens with, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves. Of course, like all first century Christians, Peter believed that the day of judgment was nigh. For this reason, he was admonishing his hearers to behave appropriately and not let the vices of the time absorb them. 
Instead, he argued, maintain constant love for one another, be hospitable to one another without complaining, but my focus this morning is on where he says, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. And whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. As I apply this to the life of Put Peter, I must immediately acknowledge that everyone here, what everyone here already knows, Peter Magubane was not your everyday worshiper, upon whose presence the local church much depended for its soup kitchen to function on Saturday morning. No. But with that aside, we can confirm that Magubane believed in the Creator God, the fountain of life in the created order. Genesis 1, verse 27 says, So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Of all creation, this image of God is the privilege of only the human person. What we know about the image of God is how God is described in Scripture. And the image of God, therefore, is in how those attributes of God are manifest in us as God's image. Our assumption is that every person, every human being has the capacity or potential to manifest in their lives any and almost all the attributes that make up the image of God. For we all must be born with the same original package for God's image given at creation. Love, for example, God is love. Creativity, power, almighty God, freedom, holiness, justice, and righteousness. These are only some of the attributes of God that we inherit by virtue of our being created in God's image. In the way that we live our lives, we can we accentuate some of these divine attributes in varying degrees. And we also can suppress others as our character shapes up in the context of our environment. Of the many attributes of God, two stand out in Peter Magumani's path of life. The first is love, God's attribute of love, because God is love, says the Bible. In the African cultural dispensation, this love ethic is known as Ubuntu, love and honor for the other as a way of life. So much so that when we say a person aganabuntu, we go so far as to say agangomuntu maingenabuntu. So we confirm the humanity of the person by how they live up to the love attribute of the image of God given at creation. The second attribute in the image of God given to us that Peter Magubani accentuated in his life is creativity. God is creator, and therefore creativity is a human fundamental for which all of us have the God-given potential. It takes special creativity, though, for one to become a world-renowned photographer from the dusty townships of apartheid South Africa with hardly a well-equipped studio. But by all accounts, Peter excelled in living out his image of God in at least these two respects, the love ethic and creativity. I knew but Peter very casually and got to meet and develop a personal relationship with him only in 1975 when we met at Dr. Ntato Mutlana's place. We had an extended time to exchange notes on the various versions of burning orders. He had just come out of a heavy duty one and I was living with what we called a mini ban that I had received together with lawyer Griffiths and Klange and Bishop Manos Butelis. I was later to receive the Magubane size banning order after my wife was already living with it. We call this a mini ban because while it prohibited being in the company of more than one person, prevented being quoted or published, 
or entering the premises of manufacturing, publishing, and education, it did not confine one to a single municipality. This was light compared to that which Makubane, as well as my wife Togo, had, where she also had to report weekly to the police station. At the time I was working for the Black Community Programs, and Peter was with the Run Daily Mail. It was many years later that he was to have an assignment with me. I requested him to do photography for a Southern African visit of the Board of Directors of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. When there was concern about his price, I, I attested that he is every shot would be worth more than double the dollar value of that shot. It was during this time that I got to know Makubane's bundulious respect for other people. He did two remarkable things. First, he would not just take pictures of people without asking for their permission. This is long before the popia required it. Secondly, in the manner that he took his shots, he would aim and fix his camera, then look outside the lens to see the person he was photographing with a naked eye. I asked why he did this. He explained that it was out of respect for the people that he was photographing, that they must know that he is seeing them. He was, he, that he was, he, he was, he, sa he says, photographing is, a person is like talking to them. And you look at people when you're talking to them. As he put it, this means you have to apply a respectful eye there has to be a mutual recognition between the photographer and the person being photographed. But then, of course, he went on to say, he just thinks it's a better shot anyway when you see what you're shooting. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. Photography was the medium of Magubane's creativity where he lived out his image of the creator God. But photography also became the site, the locus, for his expression of love, as manifest in the loving respect he held out for the people he photographed. But a deeper level of love was in his selflessness, in personal sacrifice, giving of himself at least at great cost to his person and to his family. As Jesus says, no one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The struggle for justice and democracy became Makubane's expression of the love ethic. For Nelson Mandela, his expression of the love ethic in God's image was the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and equal opportunities. And he told the judge who had the power to issue the death sentence, that this is an ideal for which he was prepared to die. This ideal would define Mandela's person and his life destiny, much like the aggressive, principled, purposeful photojournalism would define Magubane's person and his life's destiny. Mark Twain wrote, there are two great days in a person's life the day we are born, and the day we discover why. Does anyone in this room question why Peter Makubane was? And when he did discover this why for himself, I say, like a good steward of the manifold grace of God, he served with the gift he had received, and did so with the strength of that God supplies. In his book, No Man is an Island, Catholic priest Thomas Merton writes, we must find our real selves not in the froth stirred up by the impact of our being upon the things around us, but in our own soul, which is the principle of all our acts. And he continues, each one of us 
as some kind of vocation. We are all called by God to share in his life and God's kingdom. Each of one of us, each one of us is called to a special place in the kingdom. If we find that, if we find that, we will be happy. If we do not find it, we can never be completely happy, writes Merton. For each one of us, there is only one thing necessary to fulfill our own destiny according to God's will to be what God wants us to be. We are here today to honor and applaud at this final curtain of his life, the happiness that Peter Magumane enjoyed through all the challenges, the discomforts, vicissitudes, and dangers of the life of his vocation. He fulfilled his destiny, and in Merton's words, according to God's will, to be what we believe God wanted him to be. In fulfilling this vocation, and always expressing his love ethic and the medium of creativity, Magubane sought to pick out through his camera those who are oppressed and in distress, marginalized and even despised. This is why the struggle for freedom and democracy became the place to dig in his heels. Be it the treason trial and the women's march at the Union buildings in the 1950s, be it the Sharpeville massacre and the Rivonia trial of the 1960s, or the Soweto uprisings of the 70s, his love ethic in the image of God, with the creativity in his skill, he was to be there whatever the cost. Imprisonment, burning orders, the burning of his home, narrow escapes from one danger to another, he stayed through to the injunction of the writer of 1 Peter who argues that like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift you, of you you each have received. The book of Proverbs says the glory of youths is their strength and the beauty of the aged is their gray hair. In Peter Magubane's case, he took the strength of God seriously when he was younger and it set his career path from which he never looked back. Such that in his iconic gray hair, he was never to be without strength. With, such, with much physical strength and strength of character and purposeful conviction, Magubane became a witness to the very presence of God in places where it mattered most for the victims. His photographic testimony could not be denied or disputed. It was there, even if it was secured through a hollow loaf of bread. In this context, he also became an answer to communities and cultural practices of communities whose precious heritages and identities were at risk. The Bantuana, the San, Basarwa, the Ndebele in his project of vanishing cultures. In this regard, when I told Peter that my son was to undergo initiation, he prevailed on us to let him photograph whatever was permissible of this journey. And for this, he traveled to Mtata, where it was to be conducted. And I stayed, as I stayed two weeks in the, in, with the initiate, he had several days inquiring and making comparisons with other ethnic cultures. I said, we all know that Makuban was not a preacher or church steward, but we bring his life today to commend him to the love and mercy of Christ the King. In the account of the final judgment that Matthew records in his gospel writing, Jesus says, on that day, people will be divided according to their deeds, and he will say to the one group, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Some of these will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed? Thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes to clothe you? He'll reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Guess what? In his love ethic of Ubuntu, Magubana did not only do photography, nor did he use his creativity only in the skill of photography. Instead, he befriended homeless people. 
especially young people, developed a relationship and finally reunited them with their families. And Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And baffled at this, Magumane says, When did I see you in these conditions and come to your aid? And the Lord will say, Peter Magubane, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's what Kinda Bama told. We bury Peter Makubane in the context of over 110 journalists having been massacred in Gaza. I can well imagine that in his prime, Makubane might well have been one of them, and we might never have seen him in his ripe old age. To those journalists, too, Jesus may well be saying the same. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He would say this for their efforts to make known the suffering of the people who to date have faced more than 65,000 tons of bombs, which is more than the weight of and power of three nuclear bombs like those dropped of Japanese Hiroshima. Jesus is able to offer this privilege because he assumed the human condition and got to feel and know human suffering firsthand unto death on a cross. But he conquered death as he rose again, as the story of our gospel reading this morning tells. While the first reading in Peter was urging us to maintain constant love for one another and to be hospitable, top, hospitable to one another without complaining, Jesus unpacks this and it happens to be what Peter Magubane has cared to do in his life in his good stewardship of the manifold grace of God. And I suggest that by God's grace, the day will yet come for Peter's resurrection. And the angel will say, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is not here, for he has risen. This speculation on the path of Magubane's soul in the merciful hands of God is not without its tensions and challenges. That may manifest especially in the family. Yes, there may be areas in the lives of some in the family where he may have failed you while he was serving everyone else. There may be unfulfilled promises where he may have failed you. There may be disagreements and aspects of relationships that may still be sour and in need of healing and reconciliation. There may be the regrets of things unsaid or things said but not reversed or explained. He is now no longer with us to pick up on unfinished business. We're going to pray here today. And as I extend my personal condolences to you as a family, I invite you to personalize the prayers that we shall do and own those aspects that best minister to you. Through the prayers, we seek to yaleza you to the love of God who has loved and accepted the ministry of our beloved Peter. For any areas that need a follow-up ministration, this team of ministers will be available at your request. I have not asked them. And so, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Come, let us pray. Holy God, we gather this morning to honor you in the gift of life. We thank you today in a special way for Peter Makubane's life. The life of the one whose living has been a phenomenal blessing for all who have crossed his path. And the sacrificial life through which 
he has been privileged to manifest your image in life. Through his practice of love, of creativity, of power, of justice, righteousness, or lived in the paradox of unassuming humility, of articulate expression, and steadfast resoluteness of manner. For this, we dedicate this day to celebrate his memory, to thank and to worship you, and to bid him farewell. Holy God, accept our prayers for the Magubani family, that they may be comforted and be consoled in their pain, and that they will be assured that in your infinite mercy, you will receive Peter into your loving arms. Wipe the tears of Peter's family, we pray, and ease their anxieties. And may the memories of this celebrated life, which have been lovingly shared all these days, and will again be in the tributes today, may this be an inspiration for his grandchildren, and a fertile seed in the eth ethic and manner of those who will follow his professional example. This we pray in the name of Jesus, whose life was expended, that we may all live for others. And he left us with the gift of prayer of faith. We now pray the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy gift as it is in heaven. We daily trespass as we forgive us against us. Lead us not into temptation. But all evil, for thine is the kingdom, ever and ever. Forever. and trusting in your promise to make alive all return to Christ. We commend Peter to you and we join with your faith and the whole company of heaven in the one unending song of praise. Glory and wisdom and honor be to our God forever and ever. Amen. God, our creator and redeemer, by your power, Christ conquered death and entered into glory. Confident of his victory and claiming his promise, we entrust Peter to your mercy in the name of Jesus our Lord, who died and is alive and reigns with you now and forevermore. Amen. Holy Trinity, in Christ Jesus, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Strengthen this faith and hope in all of us, all our days that we may live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Peter, may Christ receive you in his in grace. Together. We commend to you, Holy God, the soul of our brother Peter. In the eyes of the world, he is dead. But in your eyes, he is eternal. Forgive him the sins he may have committed in his human frailty. And bring him to his loving forbearance in peace. And bring him to your unending joy. This we ask in the name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. May Christ the Good Shepherd enfold you in love, fill you with peace, and lead you in hope to the end of your days. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Mpumlwana, Reverends Makhalimele and Waku, and the chaplain of the SAPS. Thank you very much indeed for the official church service. Shall we have a rendition of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul? as we prepare for the audiovisual presentation of the June 16 uprisings. So to allow you to transition to that presentation, let us have the rendition of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
Just an important correction. The resident pastor is Reverend Buitumelo Mahamate. Sincere apologies, uh, Reverend, lest you be called uh, the way I did. So now we are going to have the audio, the audiovisual presentation of the June 16. Over to you. audio we don't have an we don't have audio
Wow, that's very rich history captured there through the lens of uh, Peter Magubani. In the interest of time, I'm going to invite to the podium Miss Vukani Magubani to come and present the um, obit to read the obituary, which is also in the program there for your ease of uh, reference, Miss Magubani. A struggle without documentation is no struggle. Peter Magubani, June 16, 1976. Dr. Peter Sexford Magubani was born in 1932 in Vredendorp on Johannesburg's mining belt to Wilhelmina and Isaac Magubani. He grew up in the infamous Sophia town, a mixed race suburb in the city of gold. From the township streets to the hallways of power, Dr. Magubani spent more than 60 years behind the lens, capturing everything from social injustice during the apartheid era, political demonstrations and riots, to the everyday life of women. He also documented the different South African cultures. Magubani was gifted his first camera, a modest Kodai brownie, by his father when he was a teenager. After completing high school, Magubani was eager to put his camera to use. So he found work as a driver at Drum Magazine in 1954. He moved up the ranks to become a darkroom assistant to the late great photographer Jorgen Schadenberg, a man who would later become Magubani's friend and mentor. In 1955, he was given his first assignment to cover an annual ANC gathering. It is here that his journey to become South Africa's foremost photojournalist began. During his time at Drum Magazine from 1954 to 1963, Magubani took, Magubani took himself and his camera to the heart of almost every significant historical political moment during the first wave of anti-apartheid defiance campaigns and the infamous treason trials of the 1960s. In 1963, after his tenure at Drum, he traveled to London on freelance work, where he held his first international exhibition at the London School of Printing. A few years later, he returned home to Johannesburg and began working at the Rand Daily Mail, where he worked until 1980. His return was marked by political turmoil in, from 1967 to 1976, Dr. Magubani was repeatedly arrested, detained, interrogated, jailed, or placed under house arrest for the work he was engaged in. The apartheid government was determined to make his life as difficult as possible. In 1969, he was arrested and imprisoned, where he spent 586 consecutive days in solitary confinement. After, which, in, which he enjoyed in this country, which was the largest ever. After jail time, he was served with a banning order of five years, which prohibited him from working for any publishing company or publishing any photography. Magubani was highly motivated and a crafty man, a determined storyteller who was preoccupied with getting the image, no matter the obstacles. He came up with many different tricks and methods of getting his images without being detected by security police. Famously, he would often hide his camera in a hollowed out loaf of bread, an empty milk carton, and even a Bible with cut out pages to prevent from being detained by police. Once while documenting the atrocities and inhumane treatment of miners in Johannesburg, he dressed up as a mining foreman put his camera in his dust coat pocket and took pictures with the cable release. Magubani's photographs bear witness to the most defining moments in South African history. He covered the 1995 adoption of the ANC Freedom Charter. He covered the 19, 1955 adoption of the ANC Freedom Charter, the 1950s Sophia Town forced removals, 
the numerous demonstrations against past laws, the 1960s Sharpeville massacre, the Rivonia treason trial, and many more of the massacres that occurred in the 1960s. He emblazoned into our memory the cruelty of child labor in the, on the white coal and potato farms around the country. When his banning order was lifted in 1975, Magubani took to the streets to continue his work. He was front and center during the 1976 Soweto uprising when the youth took to the streets in protest of the cruel and inhumane Bantu education system. He and other journalists were determined, we detained for this time in his home. He was also burned down by the police in hopes of destroying his film negatives and to deter him from continuing with his work. In that same year, Magubani was detained by police who broke his nose and terrorized him in efforts to intimidate him. He was hospitalized and true to his character, he was not really upset that his nose had been broken. He was rather distraught that the police had opened his cameras and exposed the film with photographs he had taken that day. He's famously said that he knew that his nose would heal, but he would never be ever to be able to get those photographs back. Still, he was not discouraged from his work, nor did he have any desire to go into exile. Magubani continued to be on the ground in the turbulent 1980s when South Africa went under several declarations of states of emergency. In 1985, he was shot 17 times with buckhead and rubber bullets at one of the student activist funerals in Natal Sprait. His coverage of the 1976 Soweto uprising and the aftermath that spread throughout South Africa brought him worldwide acclaim and led to several international photographic and journalistic awards, including the American National Professional Photographers Association's Humanistic Award in 1986, which also recognized one of the several incidents where he put his camera aside in order to prevent people from being killed. His 2016 book commemorating the 40th anniversary of the 1976 student uprising is regarded as one of the most important works of a contemporary African to appear in the last two decades. From 1978 to 1980, Dr. Magubani worked as a correspondent for Time magazine. He has photographed for several United Nations agencies, including the High Commission for Refugees and UNICEF. His photographs appeared in the New York Times, Life magazine, Time magazine, Newsweek, National Geographic, Paris March, and the Washington Post, amongst others. He continued to put his life on the line, capturing the bloody, political transition of the early 1990s. He was willing and eager when Nelson Mandela asked him to be his personal photographer upon his release in 1991, up until he became president in 1994. Some of President Mandela and his wife and family photographs were taken by Magubani, a time during which he became very close to South Africa's most treasured political figure. In post-apartheid South Africa, Dr. Magubani shifted the focus of his lens to capture and archive imagery of South Africa's various peoples and cultures. His work as a cultural activist and visual anthropologist is best seen through his images of the Ndebele people, which also earned him a National Geographic cover. Magubani has published a number of books on the beauty of South African culture, cultural practices, titles including African Renaissance, Vanishing Cultures of South Africa, and Aman Debele, amongst many others. He even worked on Africana culture. He loved all people and was revered all over the world for the work he dedicated his life to. His honors are exhaustive, and I will just mention a few. The Coretta Scott King Award, the Robert Kappa Gold Medal, the Missouri Honor Medal for Distinguished Service in Journalism from the University of Missouri for his lifelong coverage of apartheid, 
the Lifelong Achievement Award from Mother Jones Foundation, the Martin Luther King Lutuli Award, Honorary Fellow of the Royal Photographic Society in London, Fellowship of the Tom Hopkins School of Journalism and Cultural Studies, the Nat Matsaka Award for Media Integrity, the Lucy Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award, the Order of Meritious Service from President Mandela, Silver Class. Dr. Magubani has nine honorary doctorates from South Africa's most prestigious universities and technical colleges, as well as doctorates from Columbia College in Chicago. He has published over 20 photography books, including, but not limited to, Magubani South Africa, Black As I Am, Black Child, Soweto Speaks, Fruit of Fear, June 1976, and Mandela, Man of the People. He has had numerous exhibitions throughout South Africa and all over the world, most notably June 16, 1976, at the Apartheid Museum here in Johannesburg. Child labor at the University of Johannesburg. Mandela, Man of the People at the United Nations in New York. And the European Center for Solidarity in Gdansk, Poland. The ex exhibition was opened by former president and Nobel Pri Peace Prize winner Lech Walesa and the late ambassador Zinzi Mandela. In 2014, in his first retrospective exhibition, consisting of 140 pictures opened at the APSA gallery and traveled throughout South Africa the following year. In 2018, to coincide with President Mandela's centenary, Dr. Magubani selected 100 of his best pictures of Mandela for an exhi exhibition in Cape Town at the gateway to Robben Island. Magubani, in 2023, the University of Pretoria Student Gallery held his final exhibition, Magubani South Africa, a retrospective of over 150 pictures of his entire career over five decades. The exhibition coincided with Magubani receiving what was his ninth honorary doctorate from the University of Pretoria. Upon awarding Dr. Magubani the Order of Meritorious Service, President Mandela said, I quote, for his bravery and courage during the dark days of apartheid, Peter became a beacon of hope, not only to thousands of journalists all over the world, but to millions of people across our country. His commitment to photojournalism helped pave the way to transformation in South Africa, and such efforts are worthy of international recognition, unquote. In his lifetime, Magubani befriended, mentored, and facilitated the careers of numerous photographers over the years. Even at 91 years of age, he continued to teach and inspire people by holding exhibitions of his work throughout South Africa and globally. His infectious sense of humor and larger-than-life laugh belied the hardships he had endured under the oppressive apartheid regime. Magubani was a real character, a man who did not finish school, but was taught everything he needed on the go, in which he called the University of Life. He was a man motivated by the sheer urgency of his times and a deep-rooted love of his people and a belief that freedom was not supposed to be an option. Magubani was also a family man, insofar as he could be in between all the responsibilities of prioritizing the anti-apartheid movement. He loved sitting outside in the garden to soak up the rays of sunshine, after which he would lovingly watch the sun set. He was a lover of the finer things in life. Good food, antiques, artifacts, sports car, a stellar pair of shoes, and a few glasses of mango juice a day. Dr. Peter Magubani is survived by his cousin, Auntie Constance, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great 
great-grandchildren who will miss him very much. He leaves behind a loving family, friends, and comrades here in South Africa and abroad. His colossal legacy and archive imagery is to be cherished, maintained, and treasured. An archive that must be shown to generations and generations beyond him so that we will never, ever forget where we've come from as a nation. Long live Peter Magubani, long live. Lala. <laughs> Lala Ngokolo Ngomose. Thank you. Shall we improve on that? Please let us give it some life. Long live Peter Magubani, long live. It needs some more life, you know. That would resonate with uh, the sound Bra Peter identified with. Let's try it one more time. Long live Peter Magubani, long live. Long live. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Vukani Magubani, a very rich obituary in the allegory of metals, copper, steel, platinum, and gold, gold is king. Peter Magubane was gold. He earned his weight in gold. And we are going to hear more tributes being offered this morning in honor of uh, Peter Magubani. We now come to the section of children, which I am also going to try and manage because of time. As we sing the hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, I'm going to invite the grandchildren to come to the front, and the one who is going to speak on their behalf will then lead us in that item. They should also be joined by the grandchildren. And after that, I will then call the children, but I will deal with that after the grandchildren. O oh Lord, my God, as the, ch the, the grandchildren come forward. And hear the brook and 
feel the gentle breeze Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art, how great Thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee how great thou art, how great thou art. Hello and good morning everybody. How are we feeling today? I know today is kind of a somber occasion, um, but my grandfather was someone with a lot of life in him. So I'm going to ask that we try to pick up our spirit as I speak on behalf of his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, and there's a great-great-grandchild as well. Um, I would like to start with a tribute from my youngest sister, Utari Roma Kubane. She was not able to be here with us today, um, but she's watching the service uh, from her home in the United Kingdom. She says, Opa, my dear Opa, a cherished memory of your mischievous and playful nature that eternally warms my heart occurred during your Doctors of Laws honoris causa ceremony at Rhodes University in 2006. Amidst the chaos of the preparations, with Dave and Momley hustling about, you and I found solace in the sitting room. As they dashed in and out, you leaned in and conspiratorially whispered, don't tell anyone, but I left my speech at home, accompanied by a wink. In that instant, I recognized the twinkle in your eye, signaling a day filled with your playful antics, and I eagerly anticipated the joy you would bring. Before departing, with mom juggling phone calls, you concocted a plan to playfully prank her, a sweet retaliation for, for her assuming control of the morning, as she usually does. Enlisting my help, you assigned me the exhilarating task of addressing her by her first name to grab her attention. Positioned strategically for the perfect vantage point, I skipped over the, with glee to carry out my mission. As she looked down at my mischievous grin, I called out every syllable of her name. Fikile, Opa wants to talk to you, and ran back to Opa for cover. The ensuing laughter as she realized our prank remains etched in my memory, a testament to your lighthearted spirit and, a fa and my favorite partner in mischief. As you took the stage to receive your well-deserved honor, still lacking a prepared speech, my concern was replaced with awe. You, you spontaneously erupted into our istagazelos, delivering a message of resilience that had the audience on their feet. Your words echoed in our hearts filling us with immense pride for your achievements and the legacy of the Makubane name. Opa, you were, the you were the bravest soul with a lion's heart and have inspired us all. The resilience you embodied is now ingrained in our family, and with heads held high, we continue your legacy with profound pride. Thank you for your contributions to our country and to our family. As your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we pledge to honor your name and carry your legacy forward. Lala Ngokolo, Ingo Nyamayami, my beloved Opa. Love you always, Tariro. Okay, back to me. My name is Ulungile Makubane. I am many things, an interdisciplinary artist, a performer, a PhD researcher. I am also one of the great Dr. Peter Makubane's grandchildren, which lately has been my favorite thing to be. And I'm here to share a few words, paragraphs, with you about him. How does one begin to concisely talk about a man of my grandfather's might? There is something so special about the art form of photography, our grandfather's greatest love. As a scholar of the arts and art, art history myself, I think it's important that we recognize the importance of role and role of photography in our country. So please allow me to get a tiny bit academic for this moment. Apologies in advance if you get lost along the way, 
but it is imperative that I do this as I find that black people in particular have not quite got the hang of studying themselves and their contributions to this world. I am and always will be an evangelist of sorts, the kind of evangelist that wants to convince my people to get into the habit of writing and etching ourselves into history. This way, no one can ever say, for example, a hundred years from now, that we were not here, or that we were a people with no recorded history, and therefore a people who could have large chunks of that history erased. What was I saying? Intellectualizing the art of photography. Social documentary photography and photojournalism emerged at the forefront of the resistance efforts in apartheid era South Africa. Photography has moved people in ways that other fine art forms could not. In historical environments where fine art and access to it was racialized, photography existed as a more accessible means of expression, but more importantly, a means of storytelling in all its manifestations. It was not by mistake that photography took precedence over other art forms in challenging the system. In South Africa, for our grandfather, the camera has played a huge role as an unshakable and undisputed witness and testimony to history as it actually was. The strength of photojournalism and social documentary photography as a resistance strategy is in its ability to communicate what we call social realism. The image maker can be both an active participant in framing and creating a moment with a camera as well as with a camera a passive, as well as a passive bystander bearing witness to an evil that relied on its public presence to uphold its ideological tenets. For our grandfather, he felt he was a soldier on the front line of injustice, with a camera as his weapon, as his weapon, and the victory he sought after was the truth. Photojournalism has a much less subjective nature than other forms of photography and was a highly intensive and direct frontline approach. For Peter Makubane, what he photographed were not just political events. They were everyday surroundings for everyday people. The state of emergency spiraled all around him. It was his personal life. For him, the personal was political, and so by default, he became a free freedom fighter with a very simple mandate. Get the image, get the image out, and get the image seen. He is known to have always gotten his shot. His photogra photographic brilliance has earned him a befitting repu reputation, international acclaim, numerous awards. Numerous awards. I mean, he was a real overachiever. One of the notions I've been insisting on reiterating is that our grandfather was not just a photojournalist or struggle photographer. No, he should rightfully be remembered as a multi-potentialite, an artist who spent his life create, creating visual archives for the canon of South African cultural history. He has always placed equal importance upon the dramatic and painful events of the past with the so-called mundane aspects of daily and ritualistic life. Our grandfather was a storyteller, a fine artist, a cultural activist, and a visual anthropologist trained by the urgency of his times. Though he stands head and shoulders high amongst a group of struggle photographers, it is his anthropologic, anthropological work and his gentle but poignant visual observation of people and their traditions that proves that he is worthy of more than a label of just a struggle photographer. Peter Makubane risked and endured much and the legacy of the archived history as captured on film has become synonymous with how we think of and visualize South African history. And to think, for him, he only knew that he had to wake up every day and try. Where would we be without his tenacity? Where would I be? I'd like to also talk about quickly what our grandfather was like as, well, just a man. He had so much spunk and so much fire. He was witty, funny, and charming. Hey. 
a gentleman at all times, but someone not to be messed with, ever. He was a true Capricorn, practical, ambitious, disciplined, stubborn, steadfast, and intense. As an enthusiast of astrology, I must say, the stars have always said that my soulmate as a Scorpio would be a Capricorn. It's no surprise, therefore, why he was my favorite guy, a man I deeply understood, respected, and looked up to. I remember our quiet afternoon sitting together in the golden hour sun. I remember my heart skipping a beat every time I would see his bright red Toyota Corolla. I remember being so fascinated and impressed. Oh my God, did somebody have a tissue? My maker, oh. <laughs> I have to finish this, can I have a tissue? Thank you. I remember his undying love of a good cup of coffee and a sweet biscuit to accompany. He had a habit of forcing me to sneak him sweet treats despite struggling with diabetes. He always said there was not a sweet on earth that could kill him if he survived apartheid. I remember his profound love of 1930s and 40s jazz. Your Mahalia Jackson, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, the first time I heard Mahalia Jackson was off a of vinyl he played me on his very treasured, not to be touched, 1920s gramophone. I remember him being able to, never being able to raise his voice at me, and in the same breath, yelling everybody else into oblivion. He was never short of decibels when it came to my mother. <laughs> I remember him buying me my first digital camera and the flash accessory to go with it. Bless him. I tried myself out with photography, but very quickly discovered that my talents were better suited to the art of singing. One legendary photographer is enough for one family. I remember him knocking on the door of my matric history classroom one morning at school and seeing my history teacher go white in the face. As a specialist in South African history, he was an avid collector of my grandfather's books and couldn't believe his eyes. I remember him meeting my son and, laughing at, and me laughing at how confused he was that his grandbaby had a baby of her own. He also kept asking why he looked so Asian. I told him those eyes, the same ones my mom has, the same ones I have, they definitely came from somewhere in your family line. I remember him yelling, is Tagazelo Zawama Kubane when I received my high school diploma at the United Nations headquarters in New York. I remember, I remember him yelling them just about anywhere he got the chance to, to be fair. Typical Zulu man. Lastly, I will remember the way he looked at me, his Lulu, like I was perfection, with all my quirks and strange fashion choices, as he would call them. He loved me just the same. He looked at me like I was enough. And as a young black woman in today's world, that means everything. I only wish now my only wish now would have been that he would have had the opportunity to see me sing. That will be my only sadness going forth, as I intend to celebrate his life by embodying the gift of creativity that he so generously poured into me. Now, let it, let, it goes without saying that our country is at a very crucial juncture at which we must intentionally and deliberately and fearlessly try to build a nation that has not just emerged from a past, but looks toward a future a feature that is inclusive of its artists and cultural workers, old and young. Let us continue to acknowledge that we are an expressive and cultural people, and all our voices should be equally collated to craft a truly South African story that can feasibly compete around the world, as artists like my grandfather have clearly shown. Let's really live life and protect his, this reality that was once a pipe dream for fi freedom fighters like my grandfather, Dr. Peter Makubane. Yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, sure. Greetings to everyone present. Greetings to Your Grace Bishop Malusi Mpulwana, Your Excellency President Sir Ramaphosa, Your Former Excellency Thabo Mbeki and Zanele Mbeki, the Premier of Gauteng, Panyazela Sufi, Minister Sizek Sizi Kodwa, and all protocol observed. And most importantly, greetings to the Magubani family. Although we may be clothed in all black, today is not a day of darkness, but a day of light. Because I know very well that Opa is upstairs in heaven asking God to make sure that the light that shines upon us shines very bright. So just like the picture to my left, let us all smile and show our pearly whites as Opa enters the pearly gates. In Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, it says, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Dr. P Peter Magubane, Opa. We lay your soul to rest and return you to the earth. God had to take you back because he knows you fulfilled your life's work. No amount of silver or gold could amount to your life's worth. May your soul find peace and rest after the long, virtuous and fulfilling life that you've lived. As your spirit returns to God who blessed us with your existence, we say thank you to the Heavenly Father for gracing us with your presence for gracing us with a man of immense figure whose impact will live to stand the test of time. A man who turned his passion into something even though they told him it was a crime. He saw a mountain and never hesitated to climb. You've reached the top of the summit and now it is our job to lower you down safely so that you never plummet. This is definitely hard for us to stomach, but I know you've left us more than full. As said previously, Opa's favorite drink was a refreshing glass of mango juice. So I want us all to take this moment to imagine that we have the most refreshing glass of mango juice in our hands and we give a toast to an icon. We will miss you now that you're gone and may the legacy of your archives live to sing your songs. Thank you, everybody. Sanbonan into um cool was fun this ion. Um a peggy pants my window, um to peg me swing, as was good tax up. Babem bona a fella, Bamanga le second to live. But but by a fund and I can to sega beggars on gain the bazaar and sega. I bang a gas good business against Africa. Some time to go most, O Siega to go most, O Siega Fa, if I elegantly little eat on Gomosek Pel, Nishobonke, Isugulu, Zomsawa, and Lies South Africa, Zioti Mazit is the founder, Nay Dabaza Zenzega, Dala, Lies South Africa, Bias Guti Ikaw in Alcorn, Ela Bizoliti, into Nem Shop, Uncle Mos, Soto, Chian. Where the Malinga, Walling Amachi, Copindo over in Dab, Mzilingat, by it. Thank you, you changed it. Thank you. Siabonga Kakulu to the grandchildren. Uh, they have to the children, they have stolen your thunder. So I expect you Njeniti Amangapungap because uh, the time is gone. Now I can manage you because you are adults. As we sing a Methodist song, Halim Posa Tsepoyaka, let us give it that Methodist Voma. Amen? Yeah. Oh, I'm a Methodist Akona. Ambassador Makubani, who comes first? Please come first.
His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, former President Tabombeki, Premier Panyaza Lesufi, Minister Zizi Kotoa, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family. Thank you all for gathering here today to celebrate the life of a remarkable man, a father and an extraordinary photographer who captured the heart and soul of an era marked by struggle and triumph. We gather not in sorrow, but in gratitude for the life of a man whose lens was not only a tool for documenting history, but a powerful instrument for change. My father was more than just a photographer. He was a witness to the tumultuous times of the apartheid regime in South Africa, and through his lens, he told the stories that needed to be told in the face of adversity. He found the courage to stand against injustice and use his craft to expose the harsh realities of a society divided by racial discrimination. As we reflect on his life, we remember the countless moments he captured, images that stirred emotions, challenged perspectives, and inspired action. His photographs were not just pictures. They were powerful narratives that conveyed the resilience of the human spirit in the face of oppression. Through his work, my father became a silent but potent voice for, the, for who, those whose voices were suppressed. In the dark room, he developed not only photographs, but also a deep understanding of the human condition. He believed in the transformative power of art and he used his camera to shine a light on the darkest corners of society, bringing attention to the struggles of those who were marginalized and overlooked. But beyond the lens, my dad was a man of compassion and integrity, often quite jovial in his approach to life, regardless of his first-hand accounts of many atrocities. He was a nurturer, a validator of my dreams and beliefs, present when I laced my first pair of football boots, vocal when wanting to engage on cross-generational topics, whether it be the GOAT debate between Muhammad Ali and Floyd Mayweather, or even Diko Mulisa and Joe Mazzano. He always made the time to have the exchange, because simply put, at any given time, who I was, what I had to say, and the ideas that shaped my life mattered. Today, as we bid farewell to Ngomose, let us remember the legacy he leaves behind, a legacy of courage, compassion, and a commitment to making the world a better place. In our grief, let us also find solace in knowing that his spirit lives on in the images he captured, the stories he told, and the impact he had on the world. Thank you, and may we all find comfort in the enduring legacy of a remarkable photographer, a father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and an advocate for justice. Thank you, thank you Nkomose, well done, representing your family, well done. Now I'm going to call upon Peter Magubani's daughter, our ambassador, Fikile Magubani. Please, let's give her a round of applause. Your Grace, Bishop Mpumlwana and members of the clergy, Your Excellency, President Cyril Ramaphosa, Your Excellency, former President Mbeki and Mrs. Zanele Mbeki, Minister Zizi Quarter of Sports, Arts and Culture, Honorable Premier, Honorable Premier of Gauteng, Mr. Panyaza Le Sufi, Justice Sisi Khampepe, MEC is present here today, uh, the Executive Mayor of the City of Johannesburg, Mr. Kwamanda, members of the media present, ladies and gentlemen. Today, as we pay tribute and bid farewell to our father, we are immensely grateful for the outpouring of love, support, and tribute honoring his remarkable life and achievements. I will try and do it as fast as I can, but it's, I'm just finding it, it, it may just be a little difficult. But words, words often fail to describe the enormity of the gift that our father has given to us as his family, to his people, to his generation, and generations to come, and South Africa at large. Many words, speeches, praises, and biographies have been expressed about our father over the years, more so now that we are bidding him farewell. In this regard, I have decided to try 
and be more anecdotal in my approach and speak to you, to you and, and speak about him as our dearest father. One of the things I often think about as his daughter is that there were many crossroads at which I felt very confused at the road my father took. As a true daddy's girl, I wanted nothing more but to be with, to be with him all the time. It took me growing up to begin to understand the kind of man he was. My father almost always took the path of, almost, of most resistance. Who could blame him? We lived in a time where merely existing as a black person at the time was an act of resistance. But my father was truly fearless. He went about his business with an incredible determination. Some could call it very stubborn. He was always determined to get the picture regardless of what he had to face to sacrifice in order to get it. During the tumultuous days of 1976, I recall him saying, darling, I will leave you here to take a taxi, go back home, I have to go and take pictures. I was very disappointed, of course. I looked at him and I said, what kind of father is this? But when he spoke to me like that, in that matter of fact tone, I had no choice but to understand that he had to go. He had picked a dangerous career. I understood that because he was always in trouble with the police, but nothing could, could dissuade him from getting his pictures. That was my father, the legend we are blessed to have experienced in this lifetime. He was a character indeed. He had all kinds of tricks that he used to disguise himself at protests and places where his camera was forbidden. I will try not to repeat what has been said, but I think the program director alluded to him using a loaf of bread to hide uh, his spools and so forth. So just in the interest of time, I would want to just pass that because he would use that loaf of bread, making it look like he was eating his lunch, but actually he was recording history. But I'm also visited by one of my most vivid memories of him and his tactics to avoid running ins with the law. My father was truly a renegade. I vividly remember the time when he disguised as a derelict old man. We were on our way to join a demonstration march as students to Pretoria, and between Orlando East and Nordkosek, we were stopped by police in their caspers. At this moment, we saw policemen handling some old man and forcing him down the casper to remove the many layers of his clothes. I looked on with horror and sympathy for the old man. But when I cast my eyes downwards on his shoes, I said to my friend, hey, Boche, those are my father's shoes. That's him. No one seemed to recognize the old man except for me. But I had to hold myself back so as not to give him away even though I was terrified at what they would do to him. They eventually found his camera underneath the many layers of clothing he wore and took his film out and exposed it. That was the first time I ever saw my father recoil and squirm. But on another occasion, I just thought I should mention this one, is that um, again during 1976, he ran into my auntie's place in Zondi, Auntie Kate's house, and hid inside a coal box. You know how we used to have fire stoves? So he went into this box, hid in there, and said to them, look, the police are looking for me. Don't say anything. He was in there, and the police came charging, storming and kicking into the house. They went in and searched everywhere else. Of course, could not find him. Then they said to Auntie Kate, 
Var es Peter Magubane. So my auntie looked at them and said, I don't know. So they looked around, but very disappointed that they're not finding Peter Magubane. And they left. And after he had left, they had left, my father, of course, just jumped out, popped out of this coal box, full of dust, coal on him. But he was smiling because he felt I've outsmarted these guys. Uh, so that was who my father was. Um, I have to say that photography has always been the great love of my father's life. It took a while, but as time went on, again I began to understand who my father was, not only in the world of photography, but in the larger political sphere as a freedom fighter. I knew very, all, very early on in my life that my father did not belong only to my brothers and I, but also to the nation he so deeply loved and would have died for. My father was also a family man, and I mean in the nuclear sense and in the greater sense. He has been a role model, father figure, and mentor to many men and women over the decades. We can attest to how he was very strict, humble, and respectful, a no-nonsense type of father. I have to just mention a few things. I'll leave the others. But I just recall when I was still a young girl, my father took us to his work at the Rand Enemy. I was with two of my friends, and we're walking behind him. It's lunchtime. You know how the, 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 the young guys who were selling papers would just sit around the Red, Rand Daily Mail building outside. So we're walking, and as we're walking, I'm following behind, and one of them says, Dudu. <laughs> no. Of course, so I was trying very hard not to be hearing this thing, and, um, but my father heard it. Now, it just shows how protective he was. He heard that. Now, you know, my father is not very tall, right? But he lunged at this guy on the floor, grabbed him, beat him up so badly, he didn't even look if there was any blood coming out. He just said, let's go. So we followed him into the Rand Daily Mail. He walks in, he sees Doc Bikicha like nothing happened outside, and he carries on talking like and nothing happened. But this one I'm going to say again, more or less the same thing. I'm with my father in the car driving, and we're going to my grandmother's place in White City, and I hear him say, here's this monkey. So I say, what happened now? So he turns his car around, as he turns his car around, he faces towards Mufulo, uh, Mufulo South. Of course, there's a car next to him here. He says, sit down, don't move. He opens the door, and as he opens the door, I'm trying to look, I have to say, it was a boyfriend of mine. <laughs> So this boyfriend of mine is with a lady on the side. My father pulled the guy, beat him up so badly, so badly, he left him on the ground, let's say on the tarmac. He got into the car, he did not say one word to me, we drove to my grandmother's place. My father only spoke when he got to my grandmother's place. Now that's how protective he was. Um, but of course, my father, though serious and very hardworking, he was also a man, as I said, who had a lot of spunk and swagger. He loved sports cars, he loved uh, uh, antiques, he loved go artifacts and so forth, and he would take me to auctions. And the one thing, if you really wanted to be in his good books, if you gave him Madeira cake, he'd be a happy lad. So I just knew what to give him. Madeira cake and milk, he was happy. Of course, his favorite mango juice. Uh, but plenty has been said about the legacy he leaves behind as a photographer. As our father, I see so much of him in my brothers and I, and never give up attitude, fearlessness, people skills, resourcefulness, persistence, independence, respect, and determination. Between us, I know he will live on. We are here today to say goodbye but we are also privileged and blessed to be able to celebrate my father's life and gift and to really talk, take stock of his contributions 
to his country's fight for freedom and our cultural landscape. Ours, as his children, grandchildren, and everybody else, is to ensure that his legacy lives on. But at this point, please allow me to take a moment to thank some of the people who were very important in the sunset of my father's life. In recent years, my father had been battling illness and old age, but was very well taken care of in my absence. My brother, Linda, and his incredible wife, Kate, sitting over there, our Makoti, I thank you so much. I have to say that our Makoti, or that's my sister-in-law, had a very wonderful way of making sure that my father is happy. When she wants to do that, she does the cultural thing, and she goes. <laughs> and she literally lies down. Of course, I can't reach down to, to, to do it like she does, but that's how she used to do it. So I really want to thank you very much for the time you took. It was 24 seven that you're looking after him and you would be calling me at all times to say, no, he's not okay. So I really want to thank you uh, very much. Uh, but of course, it was not very easy, but I must also thank the caregivers who were helping my brother and my sister-in-law Kate. And this is Marina, she's somewhere here in the audience, Marina. And then there's Me Edna. Where's Edna? Edna, where are you? Come, quick. So there is Edna. So between my Marina and Edna, they were the caregivers looking after my my father. It's okay, you can sit there. So I just, I just wanted to just express appreciation to them. Now, Edna was there over Christmas when my father was going through a difficult time. But she and my sister-in-law closed his eyes. But I must also say that on the 31st of December, I spent a lot of time with my father because I was due to go back to Denmark. So I can see he's gazing and gazing, but you know, you get used to this gaze and you think, I didn't think he was going, I thought he was still there. And uh, I said to him, Baba, Baba, can you see me? Can you see me? So he softly says, yes, I can. So I thought he was, um, he was fine, but it was not to be. But let me also thank the doctors that really were in attendance would like to thank, uh, thank Dr. Pezoda in absentia and Dr. Ibrahim Esop, who did everything they possibly could to keep our father with us for a whooping 91 years. He would have been 92 on the 18th of January. And I think one of the doctors, Dr. Pezoda, I called him on Saturday and I said, look, my father doesn't seem to be well. Should we not be bringing him to the hospital? I, I, I think he was trying to assure me. He said, no, I think he's better off at home, not in hospital. But he wasn't, but I could tell that he's trying to say something to me, but I was not hearing it. But as you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. And um, as the Lord has taken, I think it is just for us to try and accept it and accept that a legend has gone. Rest in eternal peace, Baba. We love you infinitely. Hambaga ashe kawe la makawe. Uifezile indi mayako. Okoko no mkulu bagulindele. Usikonzele gubo bonke. Sushangana gwelizayo. Ngomose, dibanto, jiani, tole, sotole, snuma, didiza, mzilangata. Ndanda, ndunu emshope ekezwa ngobisi. Iti ingaba bomvu, kube eyo mlanda gaz. Lala ngotolo makubani.
Thank you, uh, Sis Figile. We ask my singular lapagin at eighty proof. Bang it by Aksaba Bafan, Gantiba Saba Uba. Hey, because Nati Besunugunga and about city. Abad Bra Pedro. We have a songbird in the house, and it would be remiss of me not to allow her just to render an item. Abigail Kubeka is in the house. Just belt it out, sis Abby, the ageless Abigail Kubeka. Thank you very much for those beautiful words, ageless. <laughs> I don't know about that. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And all protocol observed. Yeah. Upita Magubani was a man of many talents. <laughs> Sometimes a comedian. And he was a musician. He loved music. He would pop in at any time my toilet each chance when at my performances. And there's one song he would always ask me to render, Love Makes a Woman. He loved that song. So I've decided to sing that song to bid him farewell. That's what we used to call each other. Thank you. Over to you. It's a jazz song. I should have been learning. Yes, my pockets, I tell you, we're full of money. But I had someone, yes, I did, over my money. Yes, it's love that makes a woman. Something told me this wouldn't last, no, no. My money is in the past, so I had to swallow all my pride and admit to myself, deep down inside, diamonds and pearls, I've had enough. But I feel so much better now, cause I'm Dressed, I'm dressed in love. Tell me it's love, love, love that makes a human being in fact. It's love that makes a woman what it is. What it is. Oh, my God. 
go back in. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sis Abigail. A big round of applause to Abigail Quebec. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is interesting. The esteemed leaders shook your hands, but John Carney took the opportunity <laughs> to land it on your mouth. And there are Peter Magubanis alive. They captured that moment. <laughs> Thank you. We had a wonderful memorial service on Monday at the Regina Mundi Catholic Church, and tributes were read at the service. So today, in the interest of time, we will not read. Those, those tributes, in fact, were read. So we're we will not do that over again. One special tribute that is going to be read. It's a tribute by former President Tabo Mbeki, and that will be read by Lorato Palazzi. Lorato, please make your way to the podium to present the tribute by his Excellency, President Thabo Mbeki. A round of applause, please. Your Grace, Bishop Malusi, Umluana, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, His Excellency President Thabo Mbeki, Premier of Gauteng, Ndade Lesufi, Minister Zizigodwa, the Makubani family, fellow mourners, I will be reading the tribute from Mayor Zanele Mbegi and President Thabo Mbegi. Our dear Figile, we heard with great sadness the news that your father, the eminent photographer and liberation fighter Peter Makubain, had passed away. We take this opportunity to convey our heartfelt condolences to you and the rest of the Makubani family. Like so many in our country, we will always remember your esteemed father as an outstanding patriot, a principled and loyal chronicler of our history and struggle. 
a master in the skill and art of photography, a liberation fighter of great courage who bore in silence the pain of his sacrifices to ensure that he never abandons his place in the front line of the struggle. As a liberation movement and a people, we count ourselves as most fortunate that we could have in our midst, at the most difficult moments, a fellow freedom fighter with the consciousness, the skill, and the determination to ensure that the story of our struggle for liberation should continuously be told as it happened and should be available for all time to all future generations. Thus do the inimitable and evocative pictures he took with his camera have a voice of their own. They speak out loudly of the pain and anguish, the courage and audacity, the involvement of the young and old, women and men, black and white, together in a great historic movement to give birth to something that would be new, beautiful and humane, even as we see them confront the snarling dogs, armed men determined to kill, traveling in vehicles of death. Haunted eyes intent to protect something that advertises its own ugliness and inhumanity. Those pictures from Peter Makubani's hand, his head and artistic instinct, also tell us of the cheering and the ecstasy, the triumph and the rejoicing, the happiness and the laughter, the celebration of Victory Day, and who we all are in terms of our cultures and our being as people, telling a story of hope after endless generations of hopelessness and despair. It was more than right that the great Madiba, Nelson Mandela, should bestow on this iconic subject of our nation's pride, Peter Makubani, the order of meritorious service, the equivalent of today's order of the Baobab. The enormous legacy that Peter Makubani has bestowed on our nation and the world will forever serve as an energizing reminder that we too, who live, have a solemn duty always to strive to achieve what is good and what is honorable. Our dear Figi the, and the rest of the Makubani family, once more, please accept our sincere condolences at the sad departure of your dear father, the people's hero, Peter Makubani. May this giant of meritorious service to our nation and to humanity, Peter Makubani, rest in eternal peace. 
kuhambe ikhawe nemchaphephe noko ke siyakhahlela sithi chamakho komosi jiani with deepest condolences from Zanele and Tabo Mbeki. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you very much. Very well presented. Thank you, Mepalate. The next stanza of our program is for our journalists to pay tribute to their former colleague. Now, journalists, just give us a sound bite. You understand what that is, because uh, we are under extreme time pressure. First, to the podium, I'm going to invite friend and colleague, Snooki Zigalala. Please give him a round of applause. Uh, Bishop Mpumlana, uh, President uh, of the country, Sir Ramaphosa, President Mbeki, and fellow mourners. Our deepest condolences to the family of Brapita Mokwane and as veterans of the league, of the ANC League, we are honored to be given this opportunity to reflect on the life and legend of a fearless photographer whose pictures told thousand horrific pictures and stories about the brutality of the obnoxious apartheid system and mobilized South Africans and international society to support the struggle against apartheid. But Peter was prepared to risk his life to take quality pictures of the atrocious apartheid living and, and working conditions of black majority in South Africa. His pictures expose apartheid, police and army brutality against South African activists who are protesting against the apartheid suppressive laws which discriminated against the majority in their own country. But Peter's pictures and those of Comrade Sen Nzema convinced the international community not to invest in but to boycott and isolate the racist regime. As a result, South African goods were boycotted, for example, in Australia and Scandinavian countries Workers refused to load and offload ships that carried goods destined for, for, for South Africa. I will quickly cut my speech and go to why am I talking about Brapita passionately. I met Brapita in 1967 at uh, Comrade Winnie Mandela's house, but had no direct contact with him as was involved in, an, in another underground structure of the African National Congress. Comrade Dwini told us that he was responsible for taking pictures of a family of apartheid brutality and army violence against South Africans. His pictures were forwarded to the International Defense and Aid Fund for South Africa and the ANC and assisted in mobilizing the international community to support the struggle against apartheid. As young people, we were, however, not intimidated, but wanted to know more about our leaders and challenge the apartheid laws, which denied South Africans of quality of education and freedom in their country. We were very restless, we told Comrade Dwayne Mandela, and brave and committed to reviving the banned African National Congress structures. As young people, we did many things. We prepared underground hiding places for trained cadres of Mkontewe Sizwe, who were to be infiltrated into the country from Zimbabwe or Botswana. We were also ready to be trained by them. We distributed ANC leaflets 
which were sent from London using underground networks in the country. These pamphlets call for mass demonstrations and the defiance of apartheid policies, uh, poli policies and guided society on how to revive underground structures of the ANC. Together with Winnie, we mobilized the youth in Soweto. That youth received political education on the history of the ANC, from Comrade Joyce Kakane, Samson Doe, and others. Using Comrade Winnie's Mandela's networks, we managed to establish a well-coordinated networks of committed comrades throughout the country and revive the ANC underground structures. However, in May 1969, police who have infiltrated our networks arrested more than 100 underground members of the ANC, who were detained, tortured, and incarcerated in solitary confinement for more than 400 days. 21, 21 of us, including Wendy Mandela, Samson Doe, Joyce Kakane, Peter Magubane, and others were charged under Communism Act. We were on trial for three months and we later released as there was no evidence that we are furthering the aims and objectives of, of communism. On our release, we were immediately arrested and detained for six months in solitary confinement again, and 21 of us were charged again under terrorism act. At the end of the trial, 19 of us were found not guilty. Only comrade Benjamin Ramotze, who was abducted in Botswana, was, was on trial with us, was sentenced to 17 years imprisonment. However, on our release, we were all banned under the, under the Communism Act. However, Brabita Magubane continued to take pictures. We kept in touch with each other, and he used to visit me at my home in Deep Kloof with his daughter, Figile, who is now ambassador, and I would do the same. Brabita was a man of few words, but a committed anti-apartheid cadre of the movement who was determined to expose through his lenses the apartheid brutality. His pictures during the 1976 Soweto uprising mobilized the world community to condemn the apartheid government. Rapita, your selfless sacrifices were not in vain. As veterans of the ANC, we will definitely renew our organization, the African National Congress. We are determined to cleanse the ANC of unscrupulous individuals who are undermining our values, principles, and traditions. As veterans of the movement, we are actively participating in all structures of the ANC and will definitely bring back society's trust in our movement. We will, we will not dis disappoint you, Brother Peter. We assure you that we'll definitely bring back the integrity of society, of the ANC in society. Lalango Kolo, Brapita Magubane, Rubalaka Khotso, Brapita, Hambagache, Social Mkonto. Thank you. Thank you, Snooky. We picked up a couple of sound bites there. Well done. Another round of applause to Snooky. I now invite to the podium a veteran journalist who worked with uh, Peter Magubane at the Rand Daily Mail and Drum magazine, Mr. Joe Colway. Paradisi 
bala pala kwa makobane thank you for giving me a chance to come and say goodbye to my brother king khone ke colleague he started working for drum in 1954, making his way up the ranks at drum. And I joined the media industry in 1961. So it's just about a few years my senior throughout. Um, as you can see, he was completely gray. And only Nakin Zikimolatela. I am also trying to gray my hair. <laughs> I've had the tributes to Pedro. From the time that his death was announced on New Year's Day, I've read the media, both social as well as commercial, and I know to what extent he is respected. I will not bore you with adding on to that list. Bela Ramos Radisi, Bor Ramos Radisi, Baradisi. I believe that the celebration will not be complete until we allow Pedro's voice to be heard today, talking about his craft, his photography and his skills. In an essay to the market Photoshop, it was in August 2022, he says, I learned a great deal from Bob Gosani. Just by following him around, Bob was a brilliant photographer and a real mentor to me in the early stages of my career. We used to call Bob the Ariel. <laughs> Bob was a very tall man, very thin, and he used to carry one camera which he hung over his shoulder, and it seemed to weigh him down. So he was our typical aerial. He was a master of, where are the photographers of? Natural light. But not only did Makubane sing praises to Peter, he says, I'm also glad 
to see that the wonderful contributions to South African photography made by people like Ernest Cole, Santu Mufuking, Rashid Lombard, George Harden, Alf Kumalo, and his brother is sitting right here, Moffat Zungu, Mike Mzeldene, Omar Pasha, Judah Nguenya, Robert Makwaza Chabalala, Walter Pizzo, Sid Semen Zima, Cedric Nunn, is naming only a few of the people he could remember at the point. But in the tone of this essay, you don't get the normal attempt to pull down other people. He is building and talking about what other people have contributed. That was Peter Makubani, always general, generous, always trying to build rather than pull down. If there's one th message we carry from him here as journalists, it's that we need to work as a team. One might succeed better than the other, but ultimately we need to hold hands. For that, I wish to thank Peter for his great contribution to our craft. The the irony for me is that on March 21, 1960, he was one of the first people to come and to the Orlando police station and cover the PAC's anti-pass campaign. I saw him for the first time that time when, at the, when I was 17. That afternoon, he left and rushed to Sharpville to go and do some more work in Sharpville. We will never forget him because of his generosity, because of his openness, because of his caring. And that is what I see from this essay that I quoted from. But Hamakubane, Rilabuhile, Haleradi Mileene, Dijara Sekanakan. May a power greater than us give you comfort in these days, and ultimately that power is going to heal you. Thank you for your generosity in allowing Makubani to work for the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now internationally renowned actor, producer and director, Mr. John Carney, Order of the British Empire. Your Excellency, my President, Sir Ramapos, my President, Mr. Tabumbi, Premier Le Sufi Nasispan. <laughs> to 
to the Magubane family through you, Fikile. We just share the friendship and the love. Normally, as artists, we never introduce our fellow artists to our families. They only know us. So when something happens, another comrade, another artist falls, the family doesn't know who we are, nor do we know who the family is. Um, this reminds me, I had a problem with my Wi-Fi, Mr. President. It keeps coming in and out. And Telcom keeps telling me they can't put fiber there. So I then called Telcom. And it's in the conversation, the lady asked, what is your ID number, sir? And I said, 430830. She says, no, no, I'm asking for the ID, not the telephone number. <laughs> Thinking of Bra Peter, if he were to answer the same question, he would say his ID is 320118. And I could hear the lady say, No, sir, I'm not asking for your fax number. <laughs> it is such a wonderful thing to be here and pay tribute to a great gentleman. I met in 1972, and we talked about his pictures and everything. He had this creative spirit when he describes the photograph. He almost relives the moment when he took that photograph. He would not explain it as, no, no, I was passing through and then I took this photograph. He has this preamble, which you must be patient because it could be much longer sometimes <laughs> to get to the point of telling you where the picture was taken. To all the photographers in the house, you may not know how you have kept us alive. I remember when I was arrested in Butterworth for putting on a play. And as the cops were dragging me, I saw a flash. And I got in the car, and they drove to Mtata, where we were charged under communism, furthering the aims of communism. I said, I did a play for crying out loud. But then while I was in my cell on the 20th day, a piece of paper from the, from the daily dispatch with the photograph, them dragging me. That was the first time I fell asleep because that photograph meant they could not kill me because the world knows they had. That was the job done by Peter Maguban. In the midst of stones and dust bins and bullets flying and tear gas, he wanted to photograph those that were grabbed by the police. And the police did not fear so much our stones and, and, and petrol bombs. They feared that camera because that camera exposed the brutality and it was a record that they have that young man. Now they have to release him somehow. I was thinking the other day, uh, Zizi, that I, if Peter was still Ubra Peter, we have to put the prefix in Amatros, Ubra Peter, we could have deployed him to Gaza. <laughs> and we would have had better pictures. Not better in the sense of better, but in the more desperate way. I'm here standing for the Living Legends Legacy Trust which was set up a couple of years ago. Minister Zizi Kodwa and I are working very hard to resuscitate and restructure the living legends. Most of us who are over 70 worked during the time where we were not paid. That's why we are poor in 2023. Lord Snowdon, the greatest photographer in England, these were millionaires in pounds. But Peter Magubane took his photographs with his own little spool and then processed them and handed them over and was not paid for those photographs. Because the man of his stature and his history and achievement should be a millionaire in US dollars. This is because that is the time we operated. That's why Minister Zizi and I and some few friends want to create 
this wonderful structure that would look after our legends. In 1994, when we got our democracy, I miss our freedom. The structures were honored. The business people were put that side. The people who were in the MK were also honored. There was the Veterans League that post the war, they would be looked after by a small stipend that allows them at least to be able to buy an Aspro when they have a headache. We in the cultural structures, we fought, we gave up, and yet we now die as paupers. And we need the minister to do something about it. So what we are working for with the minister is to find some structure that is somehow quite close, Mr. President, to the veterans of the MK, because we are the veterans of the cultural struggle. And this structure will make sure those that are qualifying, that's leave it to you for that definition, Mr. Minister, qualify to be the people we know their legacy, their footprints, they will at least be looked after in the sunset of their days, where they will be able to say, Angizuya Wasasa, I have my veteran's pension or contribution to look after my family. That is within the writers, the musicians, the photographers, the journalists, all in the arts constituency, especially who worked during apartheid. I once said to President Mandela, I have a 10 million invoice of the work I couldn't do because I rejected the work, because I was in line with the policy of the African National Congress. So someone owes me, so before anything happens, I, 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 I don't know who to give the invoice to. Should I give it to De Klerk? Because now he's going to say to me, no, I'm no longer the president. And then I said, should I give it to you, Babu Mandela? He says, I wasn't the president when you were exploited. <laughs> so I don't want to be in these two ways. So we are going to come, Mr. President, I think we should have the veterans of the cultural struggle, which I love when a minister Naledi Pando calls it cultural diplomacy. And that is going to give us an opportunity to honor the likes of Brapita Maguan. The likes that are sitting there, I mean, it's very rare at my age that there are people much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> who are sitting there, those journalists and those old ladies there. So we need to look after them. They cannot depend on Sasa and the 350. We owe them more. It's very easy. You've done it already. You recognize the MK veterans. So it's not something new. There's a formula for it. So all we want are the veterans of the cultural struggle. Lindy, well, thank you, and the family. I'm moved by you honoring your brother and his wife. In our families, we never um, somehow understand that Mrs. Kani is actually more important than Dr. Khan. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a family. They continue that legacy. And thank you to Andy and to Matthew and to come that at your age to be able to come tonight. To you, my brother and great honored friend, Bishop Mbumluan and the clergy behind me, thank you for availing yourselves at any given time to come and bless our occasions. Thank you very much. I still. Uh, Remember, we were burying someone in Port Elizabeth, and so we thought hey, we need people with that uh, code 15 about Shumayeli who could bury by a license. With all our comradeship and our degrees, we can't know about this person because <laughs> we, don't, we don't have the real license. So, you're availing your fundis in Oonke. Always come at a time when we need you basically to help us in Obama comrades in all 
Thank you to the children, the grandchildren, and thank you for the life of Peter Maguan. Thank you. Sia Bulela Brajon, Kausia Ku President, Unga Ti the money you are owed. We beg in economic terms, Uti the opportunity cost. Isa Uvakala Kakus. The opportunity cost is the foregone option. You didn't do it because of the struggle. Baza Uvakwa treasure. Kausi Chonja. Joman Jovu, please help me. Veteran journalist, also in those structures of the time, intergenerational, Mr. Movango. <laughs> Thank you, program director. Thank you, program director. Giving a lele umonga melue to Baba Cyril Matamela Ramaposa, giving a lele undunangulus fundas with Houting Ubaba Upanyaza Lisufi, giving a lele U Minister Walez Espanswas, what in a lezuk jiva, U Minister Zizigotwe, giving a lele um de Nova Macubane, Wongana, Gosoni Pau Kulu. Besengi bingele la basoni shoni pagani songe kamilson pegi leliti all protocol observed. Dr. Peter Makubane was perhaps the most celebrated photojournalist that is, this country has ever known because he started he set himself apart from the rest of us with his hard hitting revolutionary posture and bravery. This was at a time when the regime was brutal and would not think twice to act against activists. Dr. Makubane distinguished himself by going to those places that other people feared to go. His photographs constantly showed the harassment of black people and the brutality of the regime of the day. And for that, he was constantly harassed and arrested by the government. He was arrested numerous times and spent more than two years in solitary confinement. He suffered the infamous five-year burning order. It was after the expiration of that burning order in 1975 when I met uh, Dr. Makubane for the first time. Of course, he was already a legend that time, but it was in July of 1976 when Kabu Tukwana, and myself were arrested and detained under Section 10 of the Internal Security Act and sent to Modabi Prison where we would spend the rest of the year that my relationship with Dr. Makubane became stronger. As we walked into one of the cells, we stumbled upon most of the country's leadership inside that tiny cell. And there was some form of relief that at the very least we were going to be incarcerated with familiar company. We were busy trying to find places to patch ourselves when Brapita, we called, Pet, we called him Pedro Gonzalez those days, called me and asked me to plant my worldly possessions, sleeping mat and blanket right next to him. I was then to sleep between him and Joe Tolwe. Talk about being surrounded by giants. Now, let me first explain that I was shit scared of Brapita those days before the Moda B excursion. That was because I had become very close friends with Zinzi Mandela Zenani Mandela and Figile Makubane, who were inseparable and were students outside the country, Swaziland, Botswana. I used to visit them in Swaziland and Botswana occasionally, and whenever they were back in the country, we would hang out and go out to the movies and other places usually visited by young people those days. Now, you don't want the father of one of your female friends to call you and ask you to see, sleep next to him for the next forever in prison. <laughs> One of the scariest things about our detention, about Section 10 of the Internal Security Act, was that there was no end date. We did not know how long we would stay in prison. 
We were not charged, we're not being investigated, we're just being kept in custody because we're so-called a danger to society. So none of us knew how long we would be kept in custody. After my initial apprehension and silent prayer, Brapita and I would begin a relationship where I was schooled and educated in the underground politics of the African National Congress. I would also undergo intensive classes on how to behave as a revolutionary and an activist. And on my other side, Brajo would also put in sideways his lessons and lectures about the struggle in general and the, 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 the Africanist movement. So I was surrounded this side and this side, and it was fun. I was young, I was 21. One of my first lessons from Brapita was when he insisted that I should not engage in the constant debates and discussions that were the order of the day in prison. Melaiti, you don't know who's working for the system among all these people, he would say to me. As ridiculous as that sounded, it was possible some of the detainees were planted by the security branch uh, to spy on the detainees. Brad Peter was not requesting me, he was instructing me, so I took the orders. During our stay at Moda B, some of the detainees would, had a lot of things to say, but I'll just recount one incident. Uh, Ambassador Fikile, I know you had said that you want us to share anecdotes, but not after the stories you told me. I'm not going to share most of the anecdotes. Maybe some of Brapita's children took after him. One day in 1976, in August, when a bunch of students were brought into Moda B, we, the detainees, were logged into a small field where we used to play soccer with about 20 or 30 soldiers who had come in to torture the students. Kosinin Kosi happened to kick a ball and it hit one of the soldiers in the face. And all those soldiers then charged at all of us and we ran and were stuck at a wall and there was about to be a bloodbath when Brapita went to the uh, soldiers and said to them, you dare touch him. It was only then that all of us, they were like, yeah, 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 aspalandin, aspalandin. What followed after that was the soldiers being cornered when it was the reverse all because of Brapita. And after that day, everybody respected him like nobody's business. Throughout his life, Brapita did not know when his responsibilities as a photographer ended and his revolutionary life began. The two were an intrinsic partnering that always put him within an inch of catastrophe, and he did not seem to care. He would quickly put his camera aside and charge like a bull at someone, a member of the regime, to protect and defend his people. He was a revolutionary through and through, and he understood his mandate and assignment. He was one of the country's best photographers, if not the best, but he was also a consummate freedom fighter. The freedom of his people was the utmost dream in his mind, and he always saw taking pictures as part of his revolutionary contribution. Upon our release from Moda B, I got to know the side of Brapita that most people did not get to see, the underground ANC operative. I became one of the people in one of the many cells of the ANC and was involved in a number of underground activities. He always saw his camera become one, he always, sorry, his camera and his eye became one of the thorns in the side of the apartheid government. We used to quip and say that Ubrapita has got the third eye because he always saw pictures that other people didn't see. He always captured things that you were there, you had a camera, but you couldn't, you did not see. We have lost a giant. South Africa has lost a true son of the soil. A patriot has taken his last breath and the country has to acknowledge. We can only pray that God and his forefathers accept his soul and continue the tradition that had been started this side of life and give him all the awards and acknowledgement and accolades that they can give him beyond the grave. Because if anyone deserves to be propped up and celebrated, Dr. Magubani is definitely in the top list. I have no doubt that as we gather here to bid his soul rest in peace, there's a celebration in the world beyond and he's being welcomed to the land of those who will no longer suffer and no longer have to struggle just to be treated as normal human beings.
Thank you, thank you, Duma. Thank you very much indeed. I am left with one item, then Minister Zizikotwa takes over. Uh, Duma, you were incarcerated with some famous people, but uh, Brajong, when you go to the Treasury, when I got to Modabi after Oduma, my cellmate was the Minister of Finance. I kid you not. So you come with me. <laughs> he was my cellmate. And by way of introduction, I will remind him how I used to give him my extra slice of bread <laughs> at Mother Bay. My last item is Spiwe Mshambi. Spiwe, a young photographer that was nurtured by Bra Pedro. Spiwe, wrap it up in just a minute. And will the photographers please come and join him to perform your ritual. And from, from me, I'm now bowing out of stage. Thank you very much indeed. You have been a very good audience. We have not been able to manage our time, but uh, we got there nevertheless. So thank you. Spiwe, over to you. Uh, good, good afternoon. And I'm not sure, can I just invite um, all the lensmen just to just be around the coffin so that we can just, anyone who is around, please? Okay, I'd like to just give a small synopsis on, on how I met Obab Makubani as the guys are coming through. I met Obab Makubani um, in 1990. Yeah, okay. Are we still moving? Okay, right in front of the coffin. Right in front of the coffin. Okay. Okay, as, as, I, as I mentioned when I was at, um, at the memorial service, I grew up in Soweto. I grew up in Rockville. Um, I was a street kid. I used to sell coal. I used to sell firewood. I, in, initial, in, in aspect that I did not have a future. Um, my world did not exist. Um, I was left in a place that was not my biological family when my father was in prison and grew up without both parents. And therefore I became just a regular child in a township doing all sorts of things. Um, and I also hadn't started school until I was about 13 years old. Um, during the time when I started school, I was given a camera by a person that I can call a messiah. It's a lady called Ujabila Pukela. She's still around. She wanted to adopt me, but she did not have means because her family was full. But she, all she did was like, have this camera, see what you can do with it. Uh, I could not read or write, so I couldn't even operate the camera. Um, it took me about two years just to understand how the camera works. Eventually, when I got hold of it, everything changed. I just became the master of that little piece of steel because it was just, it changed. It gave me all the hope that I was looking for as a person. I carried on taking pictures on events, you know, in my community, you know, at school and all of that. And then people started telling me that you take beautiful images, you should sell them to newspapers because they, they, they portray the community as, as you see it. Well, I was reluctant in doing that, but eventually I went, I used to frequent uh, Jablani Amphitheatre where there used to be rallies, mass funerals, concerts, you know, PJ Powers used to perform there, Steve Kekan, Harare, uh, Kori Muraba, all of those. Now, this one particular day, it was not a, just, it was not a, a festival. It was, it was a, a mass funeral. Few comrades had been killed, and there was a funeral for all of that. They were all lined up in there. So, me being me, I only had just one spool of film that I saved for, and a standard lens camera, which is a 50 mil lens, but not much. So, I, I took my chances. I went to Jablana Fifiato. 
Then I ran out of that feeling as I was taking pictures. I uh, got a bit desperate, and I looked around, and there was a, like a big crew of international and local journalists that were working there. And I thought, hmm, I can't approach these people. They look too powerful. They look too, you know. I did not have that confidence, and my dialogue was not that good that I could communicate with a person and then tell them what I want. But then there was amongst them a person that was almost approachable. You know, when you look at the person, you look like, oh, you can talk to me. And I approached that person. That person was Dr. Peter Makubani. I told him what, what my name was, and I, I begged asked him for a film. And then he started asking me a whole lot of questions. He asked me, what, who are you? What are you doing here? And I said, no, I'm a photographer. I like to do this work. I see what people do. Um, and he says, okay, I'll give you a film, but we need to talk first. So he put me aside. He gave me the biggest lecture, a master class of how to become what I am today, as I'm standing in front of you. He took me through. He said, I will give you a film, but I want you to take that film and promise me something. Go work. Do whatever you have to do. Bring it back to me. Let me critique it. And then from there, you will see how we develop. I did exactly that. I brought a contact sheet, and then he circulated certain images. I said, okay, go print those. On that day, and I remember there were people like Milton Nkosi, Spokesman is right here, Bujuta uh, Ngwenya, and all of those. We just became that team, took me amongst myself, and put me with those guys and said, whatever they go, you follow them. If you see them jumping into cars, jump into cars as well. And then if you get lost, we'll bring you back or you'll find yourself back home. So I did that. And all I want to say right now is that thank you for the opportunity that Peter Makubani gave me. I was asking for a film. He did not give me his film. He gave me time. Time that I did not, you know. He listened to me. He listened to my cry. And somehow, when I was listening to the tributes today, it's only making sense now why he did what he did. He's trekking back from uh, Bob Kosani, you know, Yagen Shagabek, who put him through stages up to the way he is today, the way we celebrate him. And somehow it almost looked like it was just a repeat of history. But now he was doing exactly what happened to him into somebody else. I got very, I don't want to use the word, I got successful. I worked in almost every newsroom. Most of these people are my colleagues. I have my work all over the world. I have documented some of you sitting here. Um, and I am proud that I was given that opportunity to make that difference in a person. Honestly, truly speaking, there was no life for me before Peter Makubani came across. You know? So what I'm doing now is like I'm doing back. So um, we would love to pay a tribute in a way that we know. Um, one of ourselves, one of our own, a soldier. We are his army. So guys, if you put your camera on high shutter speed, put it on manual. Manual focus. And then on my count, we shoot. Are we ready? One, two, three, go. Thank you very much, Servo. Can we be, give them another big round of applause, please? Thank you very much. It's good to see some of the veterans. When I was still very young, they were still in the newsroom taking pictures that they are still with us today. May I at this stage, without any further waste of time, invite the chaplain of the South African Police Service to commence with the ceremony of the flag. Chaplain. His Excellency, 
the President of the Republic of South Africa, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Tabombeki, the Premier of Houting, and all protocol observed. May I request now, as we go for this second portion of us, to request the family just to remove the, fl remove the, the flowers, please. Members of the South African Police Services, will you come forward and drape the coffin?
The program director, I'm now handing over to you as a great. Thank you very much, Chaplain. As we draw to the end of our program, before we call on the president, may I acknowledge the presence of the Sisulu family, may I acknowledge the presence of the Mandela family, the rest of other eminent persons have been acknowledged, some of whom spoke here. Mr. President, as a department, we have a program which arises out of a structure that Dr. Kani spoke about. It's called Fantuka Af. The Fantuka Af program acknowledges the living legends. We recently honored, we are pleased that we recently honored our departed brother, Dr. Peter Makubane. We recently honored Dr. John Kani. And the, long, the, the list is long, Mr. President. The purpose of this program, Mr. President, and the objective is to honor and give them flowers whilst they can still smell them. The objective and the purpose of this program, Mr. President, is to honor them whilst and give them flowers whilst they can still smell them. In this way, Mr. President, we'll have less of posthumous recognition. We think we must name streets, we must name buildings and oceans and mountains, we must name roads, we must, name, we must, we must rename churches after their names whilst they are still alive, Mr. President. I have one announcement to make, a very interesting one. The rest I'll leave to the family. This one is from the church, Mr. President. It reads, and I'll read it as it is. Please remember, we're on a church premises. Commemorations that involve after tears should take place off these premises. Now, I don't know what happened in the past. Clearly something happened in the past but I hope it's still raining outside so that this cannot happen outside the premises of this church. May I at this stage, Mr. President, invite the Premier to introduce the President, the Premier of Gauteng, Panya Panya. Thank you so much, uh, Program Directors. Let me take this opportunity to acknowledge our President, His Excellency, Dr. Sil Ramaphosa, our former President, His Excellency, Dr. Tabombegi. Allow me to also acknowledge the family of Makubani and also acknowledge those that are here. Because of time, please accept when I say protocol is observed. When they said a picture is worth a thousand words. I think they meant Dr. Makubane. And therefore, I want to thank you, President, for agreeing and accepting our requests to honor this great man of our country by declaring his funeral a special provincial official funeral. So mine is to come to appreciate you and also to appreciate the family for allowing us to honor him, but most importantly, for providing the necessary support and guidance that was needed during their bereavement. As everyone has said, Dr. Makuban was a storyteller, a gentle giant, but most importantly, a hero of our struggle. As we lower our banners, we do so to prepare for better things so that the honor doesn't end today, but the honor continues forever. It makes no sense for him to have his exhibitions in United Nations, Poland, but not have his exhibitions in our schools where it matters for generations to come. As we prepare this, we want to say to the family, we are not only ending here, this is the beginning to honor this giant of our revolution. We further want to emphasize this point, that the history of our country is incomplete if the name Dr. Peter Makubane is not in that history in our classrooms. 
Honorable President, fellow mourners, fellow South Africans, let's release him. Let's release him to rest, knowing very well that he played his part so beautifully. So fellow mourners, fellow South Africans, kindly allow me to ask the head of our government, the President of the Republic of South Africa, His Excellency, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, to come and honor this great man, our President. Let us be seated, please. Program directors, Dr. Phil Molefe, and Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Mr. Zizi Kotwa, the extended Magubani family, and Ambassador Figile Magubani, President Thabo Mbeki, former president of our country, Premier Banyaza Lisufi, Premier of Gauteng, Bishop Malusi Mpumlwana, members of the local and international media fraternity, and the many friends and colleagues of the late Dr. Peter Makubani from South Africa and across the world who have come here, traveled from far and afield to be with us and fellow mourners. When I came here this morning, it was with the distinct understanding that I'm coming to join all of us to mourn our departed father. It didn't cross my mind that I would also be getting involved in drafting the budget. <laughs> and also getting some people to pull rank and say they were in detention with the Minister of Finance <laughs> and saying that uh, when the budget is drafted, there should be insertions, Dr. John Carney, of certain budget items. So I'm a bit disoriented now, <laughs> much as I agree with what you have put forward with Minister Sisi Kodra. Today we bid farewell to a distinguished landsman and one of the finest and most fearless journalists our country has ever produced. We have just heard the many tributes paid to him by veterans in the media industry, but more especially from his family, his grandchildren and his own children. Having read the many tributes that have been penned over the past week by people who worked alongside him and who he mentored, it is clear that the description of him as a legend is clearly a fitting one. We have in our midst today men and women from various generations of journalists of which Peter Magubani, fondly known as Bra Peter, formed part. As we salute him, his contribution and his service to the people of South Africa, I also join in that salutation. In doing so, I recall the tribute penned and published last weekend by one of our media greats, Mr. Matata Tzedu. He described Brapita as a freedom fighter from a cohort of revolutionary media players who were, as he called it, gorillas, 
with their cameras, with their notebooks, and with their pens to confirm the gorilla status accorded to him by Matata Tsedu, Rapita is quoted as having told the Guardian newspaper in 2015 that I did not leave the country to find another life. I was going to stay and fight with my camera as my gun. I did not want to kill anyone though I wanted to kill apartheid. And a freedom fighter he was. As the New York Times obituary put it, Peter Magubani's images documenting the cruelties and the violence of apartheid drew global acclaim, but punishment to him at home, including beatings, detentions, imprisonment, and 586 consecutive days of solitary confinement. But despite all attempts to break his spirit and to take him away from his craft, he would not put his camera down, as we have all heard. As we have all heard. We have heard of how he would, we have heard of how he would smuggle his cameras, as we heard, into hollowed out bread. And I try to imagine the imagery of how one takes out the inners of the loaf of bread and fits in a camera and then proceeds to make it though that you are having your lunch from the bread as you are shooting pictures. He also put his camera in milk cartons and we are even told that he even used the Bible to take pictures without notice of the authorities. I do believe that even Bishop Mpumlana would have agreed with that type of tactic. <laughs> we have heard of how despite having his own job to do and his own deadlines to meet, he always was ready to help and to support fellow journalists working with him in the trenches, including the many foreign correspondents who were in the country recording our horrible story at the time. In the Gospel of John, chapter 18, there's an account of the trial of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is brought before Pontius Pilate, who asks him, so you say you are a king? Jesus answers, it is you who say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. At the darkest time in the life of our nation, in a South Africa paralyzed by injustice, Peter Magubane's lens bore witness to the truth. And to quote George Orwell's famous words, in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. At a time when an unjust regime acted with impunity and callous disregard for human life, Peter Magubane's images exposed its lies. The apartheid regime did not care much for the lives it was extinguishing, but it cared much more about its own image, especially about how it was portrayed to the rest of the world. Peter Magubane's images and those of his peers upended Hendrik Frovut's great lie that apartheid was benign benevolence, a system of separate but equal and so-called good neighborliness. Peter Magubane's archive testifies to an extraordinary range. 
For many years, he was President Mandela's official photographer. Some of the most enduring pictures and images we have of our beloved Madiba were taken by his lens. He published, as we have heard, a number of photography books, including Nelson Mandela, Man of the People, and Nelson Mandela, Life of Destiny. He was there at the many turning points in our struggle against apartheid and covered the various states of emergency during the mid-80s, obviously having excelled during the student uprising. There are his stark images that documented the aftermath of the Shaftville massacre in 1960, the 76 uprising, and the many other acts of violence that were unleashed by the regime against our people. Later in life, he would go on to produce photography on heritage and culture, demonstrating the diversity of talent and creativity that he had. Amongst them is one of my favorite of his works, The Vanishing Cultures of South Africa. It is an extraordinary collection that documents the lives and the customs and cultures of our country's people. It is his depictions of everyday life for black South Africans living under apartheid for which he was best known. These images that began, he began taking in the 60s appeared in distinguished publications like Drum Magazine, Time Magazine, Rand Daily Mail, and many others. One of his best known images is of a black domestic worker stroking the hair of a white child seated on a European's only bench. The photograph got wild worldwide attention for the power of the disturbing scene that it conveyed. That photograph also painted a vivid scene of the meaning of apartheid. It was able to transport the lived experiences of black people in South Africa to many people in distant lands across the world. As important as it was to him to document the violence, the bloodshed, it was important to bring home to readers as well as to viewers the true face of petty apartheid and with its convoluted and ridiculous laws and rules. In according him this special provincial official funeral, we as the South African people are giving richly deserved recognition to Dr. Magubani for his contribution to the important craft of journalism. Above all, we are doing so because bearing witness to injustice everywhere in all its forms is and will forever remain an act of courage that is worthy of the highest acclaim. When we look at the world today, we see journalists being arrested, persecuted, and even being killed for doing their work. As we bid farewell to one of our own legendary journalists and artists and photographer, I ask that we remember the more than 100 journalists and photographers and media workers who have been killed in Israel's genocidal war on the people of Gaza. Indeed, bearing witness to the truth is a revolutionary act. Standing firm for justice 
is what must define our humanity. And that must also define our own nationality. As we lay Brapita to rest today, the International Court of Justice in The Hague will tomorrow begin hearings in the proceedings brought by South Africa against the State of Israel for its crimes committed against the Palestinian people. Our opposition to the ongoing slaughter of the people of Gaza has driven us as a country to approach the International Court of Justice as a people who once tasted the bitter effect of dispossession, discrimination, removals, racism, and state-sponsored violence we are clear that we will stand on the right side of history. It is our fervent hope that just as we are able to reconcile, to make peace, that the peoples of Israel and Palestine will find a lasting and just peace as well. In this, the 30th year since achieving the democracy that Brapita worked so hard and sacrificed so much for, we can be pleased that the media and press freedom in South Africa remains strong. The right to a free press is enshrined in our constitution. As a country, we can hold our heads up high that we have come very far from the days when Peter Magubani and other journalists were censured, arrested, persecuted, and even had to hide in coal boxes covered in black coal suit for practicing their craft. Thank you, Figile, for sharing that with us today. It's quite a moving story. We can be proud that our intellectual property regime is robust and protects the rights of journalists, of artists, cultural workers, and all South Africans and enables them to safeguard. And yes, Brajon Kani, to profit of their work. And the budgetary item that you introduced today We've heard, and I'm meeting the Minister of Finance after this, I will tell him what you said today. <laughs> Above all, we can be proud that the South African media continues in the tradition of Dr. Peter Magubani by bearing witness to injustice, to wrongdoing and malfeasance, just as his generation of journalists held the powerful to account. We continue to count on today's generation of media workers to fulfill this noble act and role without being hindered, obstructed, or censured. At the same time, we know the immense power of the fourth estate in shaping public opinion in giving an impartial and unbiased account of the truth, and in also supporting the development of a nation. As much as it is critical to point the lens in the direction of wrongdoing, I would like to take this opportunity to call on the media to give South Africans an equally balanced view of the progress this country has achieved over the past 30 years of the progress in terms of educational outcomes, access to health care, basic services, constitutional freedoms, fulfillment of the Bill of Rights. The South Africa of today is a vastly different place to the South Africa that was the canvas 
of Peter Makubani's lens. His work documenting apartheid helped to shift global opinion against the regime, as we heard, at a time when we strive to rebuild our country from a period of great hardship. Your balanced work as men and women of the media has the potential to lift the nation's spirit, to inspire and to give us courage, and to bring us hope. Let us bring to, to the people of South Africa the stories of lives that have been transformed, living standards that have been improved, and those areas where there has been positive change. Of course, not neglecting where there's been weaknesses and failures. We count on you to be the conscience of the nation. Yes, for the bad and the good, but also to be the voice of the people as Peter Magubani was. As journalists, you should not only be messengers of doom and gloom, but guardians of our democracy and merchants of hope as well. It was the Palestinian historian, academic and writer, and activist Edward Said, who once said, I do not know whether the photograph can or does say things as they really are. Something has been lost, but the representation is all we have. What we have, what Peter Magubani has left behind, opens the window into life in South Africa that will be viewed, analyzed, cited, and studied for generations to come. And yes, I agree, Premier Lisufi, that the story of our country will not be complete without Peter Magubani's life story being taught in our schools as well. Our past may not define us, but we look to it and learn from it as we carve a better path forward. Without knowledge of our past, without understanding it, we are as Marcus Garvey said, a tree without roots. A great tree has indeed fallen. We mourn Dr. Peter Magubani and pay tribute to his legacy and to the Magubani family. The nation shares in your loss. May you be comforted by the knowledge and the remembrance that his work lives on. And we say farewell to a real Mkonto. Hambagahle Gomose. Hambagahle Gian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Subs, the family, the family being joined by the president and other. Uh, I'm not sure if President Mbeg would like to join, but they will also be part of the family. Shall I, at this stage, invite Subs to conclude on the ceremony? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the program director. I'm now going to call the marshalling officer, Lieutenant Colonel S. Mukise, to come forward and give us directives. Uh, 
let me start by uh, greeting the men and the women of God in our midst, in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me greet the family of uh, Dr. Makubane in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. His Excellency, our beloved President Ramaphosa, I greet you, say, in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless our President. President Peggy, I greet you, say, in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Minister Zizigodo, I greet you, say, uh, our Premier of Gauteng, our one and the only, I greet you, Prima, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am Lieutenant Colonel Mkise. I am from the Gauteng Provincial Drill Squad with the members of the SAPS in our midst. We are here to say fare you well, our one and the only beloved hero of our South Africa. We are going to lay our hero in this fashion. The procession will be led by our chaplain and the chaplain will be followed by our bearers. Our bearers will be followed by the pole bearers. Then when we lead the procession out of the church, I will request with your permission, uh, President, to kindly and uh, humbly request, because we have the guard of honor that will be forming part. We have the leading detachment that will, form, will be forming part, but they won't be forming part inside the church. They'll be forming part outside. So before we can start and before I can explain further, with your permission, may I please request that the guard of honor, as well as the leading detachment, please move out of the church and take your positions outside. Let us move quickly, colleagues. Let us save time. As I've explained, President, as we'll be moving out, we request that the family will follow the pulperas as well as the police mourners. The president will be part, will form part of the family, as the minister has explained, as well as our former president will part, form part of the family. From the family, we request that when we are forming the second part outside, we request that the family vehicles as well as the president vehicle, follow the police from behind. The reason being that when we will be marching, we are giving each other some orders. So for us to be audible enough, we need enough space so that we can be able to hear each other when we give orders. I hereby call now our bearers. Our bearers will be Warrant Officer Madisa, Warrant Officer Matambo, Warrant Officer Lidwaba, Warrant Officer Piri, Warrant Officer Korombi, Warrant Officer Molife, Warrant Officer Mashila, Warrant Officer Musimango. Moruti, 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 shift along. Paras, take your positions. Just be careful, dear colleagues. 
بكفو لزكو بداون شوف I request that the congregation stand. The poll bearers will be Brigadier Mpasane, Brigadier Murema, Brigadier Mahamata, Brigadier Sibohodi, Brigadier Mkina, and Brigadier Tungwane. Paul Perez, take your position. Police Monas, come and join. His Excellency President Ramaphosa, we are now moving out. We request that you join us with the former President Tabom Begi, as well as the family, as we move out. Thank you. God bless.
Ich
Well, that's right, Nzinga. The cortege is about to leave the Bryanston Methodist Church now after the conclusion of uh, the church service. And uh, it will head now to the Four Ways Memorial Park. And that is where the final resting place will be of uh, this uh, journalistic giant, uh, world acclaimed uh, photographer, Dr. Peter Makubane. Of course, a special uh, provincial official funeral is what he has received. As you can see, the visuals right in front of us, the guard by the South African Police Service is what accompanies uh, this uh, kind of special send off. And of course, uh, hearing from uh, the president as well, you know, uh, who was uh, delivering that eulogy, saying that the apartheid regime did not uh, uh, care much uh, for the lives of those it extinguished, but it cared a great deal about its image. And uh, essentially, uh, the president also in paying tribute, uh, also indicating, uh, you know, that um, the image that was portrayed at the time, portrayed to the rest of the world, it's images that Dr. Mac Peter Makubane and his colleagues uh, had captured that gave a true account of the atrocities of the apartheid government. Uh, in accordance, of course, with the special provincial official funeral, uh, the president saying that as South Africans, they were richly giving uh, this deserved recognition to Dr. Makabane for his contribution to the important craft of journalism. And him also indicating that we're doing so because uh, bearing witness to injustices everywhere in all of its forms, that's what the president said, that will forever remain, and that will forever remain an act of courage that is worthy of the highest acclaim. So the president also saying, let me just uh, be quiet for a second, as of course. Also, uh, this guard continues. service which has just been concluded in Singer and the president also saying that when we look at the world today uh, we're seeing journalists being arrested uh, persecuted and even killed uh, for doing their jobs and uh, he says that as we bid farewell to one of our own legendary journalists that so we should also remember uh, the slaughter of journalists in the ongoing war on Gaza let's take a listen to what the president had to say there when we look at the world today, we see journalists being arrested, persecuted, and even being killed for doing their work. As we bid farewell to one of our own legendary journalists and artists and photographer, I ask that we remember the more than 100 journalists and photographers and media workers who have been killed in Israel's genocidal war on the people of Gaza. Indeed, bearing witness to the truth is a revolutionary act. Standing firm for justice is what must define our humanity. Uh, the cortege now leaving the Bryanston Methodist Church after the conclusion 
of the church service for Dr. Peter Makubani. The president also earlier touching on uh, the hearings at the International Court of Justice uh, are brought by South Africa against the state of Israel. Let's take a listen to what President Ramaphosa had to say with regard to that action. As we lay Peter to rest today, the International Court of Justice in The Hague will tomorrow begin hearings in the proceedings brought by South Africa against the State of Israel for its crimes committed against the Palestinian people. Our opposition to the ongoing slaughter of the people of Gaza has driven us as a country to approach the International Court of Justice as a people who once tasted the bitter effect of dispossession, discrimination, removals, racism, and state-sponsored violence, we are clear that we will stand on the right side of history. It is our fervent hope that just as we are able to reconcile, to make peace, that the peoples of Israel and Palestine will find a lasting and just peace as well. All right, and also an assurance uh, from some of the mourners uh, that uh, the ANC, which is of course the governing party, will not let Dr. Peter Makobane down. After all, he fought for the democracy that we now enjoy alongside many others. And of course, there's been criticism of the current state of the ANC and some of the challenges that the country is facing at the helm of the ANC. Let's take a listen to what veteran journalist Snooki Zigalala had to say. But Peter, your selfless sacrifices were not in vain. As veterans of the ANC, we will definitely renew our organization, the African National Congress. We are determined to cleanse the ANC of unscrupulous individuals who are undermining our values, principles, and traditions. As veterans of the movement, we are actively participating in all structures of the ANC and will definitely bring back society's trust in our movement. We will, we will not dis disappoint you, Brother Peter. We assure you that we'll definitely bring back the integrity of society, of the ANC in society. That's right, as uh, the cortege, uh, the last uh, uh, cars make their way uh, from the Bryanston Methodist Church uh, to the final resting place of uh, Dr. Peter Makubane, certainly described as a giant in the media fraternity and certainly someone kept on referring to this as uh, uh, we went through uh, the proceedings today in terms of the final resting place of uh, Dr. Peter Makubane, uh, described as a gorilla with uh, a camera, described as a freedom fighter with a camera, while many took up arms to fight against the oppression of the apartheid government. This was someone who used the camera to highlight uh, the plight of black South Africans during apartheid. And it's those images that many say had fostered and even bolstered international solidarity for the plight of black people in South Africa at the time. So the procession uh, making its way to the Four Ways Memorial Park in just a moment. The president also, uh, his uh, convoy is also scheduled to leave in just uh, a few moments. In fact, it is now just moved towards uh, this direction. Of course, him paying tribute uh, to um, Dr. Peter Makubane in that uh, him, of course, indicating that this man was a giant. He was someone who carried out his work with uh, precision. 
uh, many describing how this giant had also assisted uh, them, uh, the younger generation of photographers, how uh, they were assisted by the likes of Dr. Peter Makobani while he did his work. He never forgot about the assistance uh, towards uh, the younger generation and was always concerned about uh, you know how they did their work. So the baton certainly has been handed over to that generation of young photographers and it's that generation that, that the president uh, uh, of course also indicating uh, should be carried well by the generation of um, photographers that has come uh, well way after Dr. Peter Ma Kubane certainly went on to inspire uh, many a journalist, including myself and my colleagues, as well as photographers um, within uh, the field, of course, of uh, journalists. Uh, definitely one of uh, the most celebrated uh, photographers um, in South Africa for the role that he has played for the attainment of uh, a democracy in South Africa, and certainly. Uh, one uh, to be remembered, he will of course uh, be laid to rest at the Four Ways Memorial Park. That's of course here in Johannesburg. The depictions of everyday life for black South Africans living under apartheid for which he was best known. We look to those images, the president's also referring to some of those images uh, that he began taking in the 1960s, appearing in distinguished publications, your drum magazines, time magazines, and the Rand Daily Mail and others as well. A photograph, uh, of course, of a black domestic worker stroking the hair of a wild child seated on a European's only bench. That photograph, you'd recall, going worldwide, getting worldwide attention for the power that it displayed, certainly with the picture that was taken by Dr. Uh, Peter Makubane. All right, uh, that's where we're going to uh, leave it for now. This is as the procession uh, makes its way uh, to the Four Ways Memorial Park, and that will be the final resting place of uh, this legend, uh, world acclaimed uh, a photojournalist, Lensman, Dr. Peter Makubane. SABC News senior reporter Crisalda Lewis at the funeral service there. Thank you so much for that update. So many poignant moments from the funeral of Dr. Peter Magomane, which we bring in SABC News. You can also continue viewing or go back and view on our SABC News YouTube page. It's time for a short break. We're
weapons. They were at a time others thought that the only weapon and instrument we have at our disposal was AK-47. Hence they crossed the Limpopo, went to different parts of the world. He used lens as his AK-47. Little did we know at that time that not only a stone was the only element and instrument we have, but a lens can do so much to expose the brutality, the injustices that was meted against the majority of people in South Africa. He has gone through a lot and we thank him so much. Whilst it's the moment of sadness to send him a dignified send off today, but it's a moment of celebration of such a selfless contribution using a lens, telling the story. And I think it is such stories that must be documented. Recently, I had a conversation with people of his, uh, of his ilk that there are moments in South Africa that we need to document, including the moment where we won the World Cup. There was something that was happening in the country at that moment. And I think that moment must be filmed, that moment, there must be good pictures of that moment, there must be documentaries, there must be telenovelas about those moments, there must be music about those moments. And I think people like him will be missed, but I'm sure he has left a lot in the industry who came from his hands. So it's truly a moment to celebrate. Quite significant because it was his images and the images of his colleagues uh, that were beamed across the world and that's where we saw international solidarity for black people in South Africa who this violence was being meted out against. When we talk about the liberation struggle, it means there were all people in South Africa participated. In other words, mass internal resistance, you had people like him, you had those who believed that they were throwing stones, you had people who used songs, dance, you had people who, like Chico, who produced, were very proficient in their songs with Brenda Fassi, my black president. You had people like uh, Mungeni Ngema, uh, freedom is coming. So there's a lot of different sectors that played a particular role to our liberation. And that's why we must always appreciate that our freedom came through the resistance of the old people in South Africa. Minister, thank you very much for your time. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, sorry about that. Christine. No problem. Let's bring Mum Abigail. She's somewhere. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Are we ready? Uh, Abigail, thank you very much for your time. This is a pre-recording. Um, quite a loss, uh, you know, for uh, South Africa uh, in that uh, there were many people who played their role in uh, the attainment uh, for democracy in South Africa. And Tatu Makubane used his lens uh, to highlight uh, the plight of black people in South Africa at the hands of a brutal apartheid regime. Your condolences. A great loss. A great loss. You know, he saved us. He saved the world. But he's not gone. He's still with us because his work, what he fought for, what he did, is still here and we cherish it. And uh, I'm so happy at the, mem at, at the memorial, some of, some of the guys were talking about him and they were saying they were picking up the baton which is wonderful. So, to the family, to the world, to South Africa, to the world, my condolences. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello and good morning, everybody. How are we feeling today? I know today is kind of a somber occasion, um, but my grandfather was someone with a lot of life in him. So I'm going to ask that we try to pick up our spirit as I speak on behalf of his grandchildren and his great grandchildren. And there's a great great grandchild as well. Um, I would like to start with a tribute from my youngest sister, Utari Roma Kubane. She was not able to be here with us today, um, but she's watching the service uh, from her home in the United Kingdom. She says, Opa, my dear Opa, a cherished memory of your mischievous and playful nature that eternally warms my heart occurred during your Doctors of Laws honoris causa ceremony at Rhodes University in 2006. Amidst the chaos of the preparations, with Dave and Momley hustling about, you and I found solace in the sitting room. As they dashed in and out, you leaned in and conspiratorially whispered, don't tell anyone, but I left my speech at home, accompanied by a wink. In that instant, I recognized the twinkle in your eye, signaling a day filled with your playful antics, and I eagerly anticipated the joy you would bring. Before departing, with mom juggling phone calls, you concocted a plan to playfully prank her, a sweet retaliation for, for her assuming control of the morning, as she usually does. Enlisting my help, you assigned me the exhilarating task of addressing her by her first name to grab her attention. Positioned strategically for the perfect vantage point, I skipped over the, with Lee to carry out my mission. As she looked down at my mischievous grin, I called out every syllable of her name. Fikile. Opa wants to talk to you, and ran back to Opa for cover. The ensuing laughter as she realized our prank remains etched in my memory, a testament to your lighthearted spirit and, a fa and my favorite partner in mischief. As you took the stage to receive your well-deserved honor, still lacking a prepared speech, my concern was replaced with awe. You, you spontaneously erupted into our istagazelos, delivering a message of resilience that had the audience on their feet. Your words echoed in our hearts, filling us with immense pride for your achievements and the legacy of the Makubane name. Opa, you were, the you were the bravest soul with a lion's heart and have inspired us all. The resilience you embodied is now ingrained in our family, and with heads held high, we continue your legacy with profound pride. Thank you for your contributions to our country and to our family. As your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we pledge to honor your name and carry your legacy forward. Lala Ngotolo Ingonya Miami, my beloved Opa. Love you always, Tariro. Okay, back to me. My name is Ulungile Makubane. I am many things, an interdisciplinary artist, a performer, a PhD researcher. I am also one of the great Dr. Peter Makubane's grandchildren, which lately has been my favorite thing to be. And I'm here to share a few words, paragraphs, with you about him. How does one begin to concisely talk about a man of my grandfather's might? There is something so special about the art form of photography, our grandfather's greatest love. 
as a scholar of the arts and art, art history myself, I think it's important that we recognize the importance of role and role of photography in our country. So please allow me to get a tiny bit academic for this moment. Apologies in advance if you get lost along the way, but it is imperative that I do this as I find that black people in particular have not quite got the hang of studying themselves and their contributions to this world. I am and always will be an evangelist of sorts, the kind of evangelist that wants to convince my people to get into the habit of writing and etching ourselves into history. This way, no one can ever say, for example, a hundred years from now, that we were not here, or that we were a people with no recorded history, and therefore a people who could have large chunks of that history erased. What was I saying? Intellectualizing the art of photography. Social documentary photography and photojournalism emerged at the forefront of the resistance efforts in apartheid era South Africa. Photography has moved people in ways that other fine art forms could not. In historical environments where fine art and access to it was racialized, photography existed as a more accessible means of expression, but more importantly, a means of storytelling in all its manifestations. It was not by mistake that photography took precedence over other art forms in challenging the system. In South Africa, for our grandfather, the camera has played a huge role as an unshakable and undisputed witness and testimony to history as it actually was. The strength of photojournalism and social documentary photography as a resistance strategy is in its ability to communicate what we call social realism. The image maker can be both an active participant in framing and creating a moment with a camera as well as a passive bystander bearing witness to an evil that relied on its public presence to uphold its ideological tenets. For our grandfather, he felt he was a soldier on the front line of injustice, with a camera as his weapon, as his weapon and the victory he sought after was the truth. Photojournalism has a much less subjective nature than other forms of photography and was a highly intensive and direct frontline approach. For Peter Makubane, what he photographed were not just political events. They were everyday surroundings for everyday people. The state of emergency spiraled all around him. It was his personal life. For him, the personal was political, and so by default, he became a free freedom fighter with a very simple mandate. Get the image, get the image out, and get the image seen. He is known to have always gotten his shot. His photogra photographic brilliance has earned him a befitting reputa reputation, international acclaim, numerous awards. Numerous awards. I mean, he was a real overachiever. One of the notions I've been insisting on reiterating is that our grandfather was not just a photojournalist or struggle photographer. No, he should rightfully be remembered as a multi-potentialite, an artist who spent his life create, creating visual archives for the canon of South African cultural history. He has always placed equal importance upon the dramatic and painful events of the past with the so-called mundane aspects of daily and ritualistic life. Our grandfather was a storyteller, a fine artist, a cultural activist, and a visual anthropologist trained by the urgency of his times. Though he stands head and shoulders high amongst a group of struggle photographers, it is his anthropologic, anthropological work and his gentle but poignant visual observation of people and their traditions that proves that he is worthy of more than a label of just a struggle photographer. Peter Makubane risked and endured much and the legacy of the archived history as captured on film has become synonymous with how we think of and visualize South African history. And to think, for him, he only knew that he had to wake up every day and try. Where would we be without his tenacity? Where would I be? I'd like to also talk about quickly what our grandfather was like as, well, just a man. He had so much spunk and so much fire.
He was witty, funny and charming. A gentleman at all times, but someone not to be messed with, ever. He was a true Capricorn, practical, ambitious, disciplined, stubborn, steadfast and intense. As an enthusiast of astrology, I must say, the stars have always said that my soulmate as a Scorpio would be a Capricorn. It's no surprise, therefore, why he was my favorite guy. A man I deeply understood, respected, and looked up to. I remember our
Put up. Oh, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Thanks, Richard. What a I'm telling you. I'm It's not easy, but.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to thank you, the Heavenly Father, for being with us. Thank you, the Heavenly Father, for allowing us to celebrate the life of one of our own. We want to pray, the Heavenly Father, for the family, you know, the Heavenly Father, the life without a father is not an easy life. We want to pray, the Heavenly Father, that be with the family. You know there are challenges. And we know also that as a, as a Christian, we know that this is not the end of life, but the beginning of a new life with our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ the one who died for us and liberated us from the bondage of sin. Amen. One, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. I am now going to request.
分。I am now going to request the family to come forward and do the rituals before we lower the coffin.
Yasui Loa the Prophet. I'm now going to request the South African Police Services to render an item abide with me, then it will be followed by all the necessary protocol that is inserted about this matter. Leading detachment, shoulder, arms, one, two, three, four, one.
Followed by the brigadier, and the last person to salute will be the marshalling officer to come forward and pay the last respect to the fallen heroes. But the saluting normally we are doing at the feet, that's how they are facing the direction. That concludes the official funeral as was intended by the President of the Republic of South Africa. Thank you so much for partnering with the South African Police Services. May the Almighty richly bless you. I'm now handing over 
to the reverend to can proceed to the very advice. God bless. as much as you have called your servant Peter Makubane to be with you in eternity, who now commit his earthly body ashes. Dust to dust. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Almighty God, look with pity upon the sorrow of your servants, for whom we pray. Amidst things they cannot understand, help them to trust in your care. Bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them and give them peace. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of our troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at last. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Peter Magobani. Before he was ours, he is yours. For all that Peter Magobani has given us to make us what we are, for that of him which lives and grows in each of us, and for his life that in your love will never end, we give you thanks. As now we offer Peter Makubane back into your arms. Comfort us in our loneliness, strengthen us in our weakness, and give us courage to face the future unafraid. Draw those of us who remain in this life closer to one another. Make us faithful to serve one another. And give us to know that peace and joy which is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.
Now we shall invite the family indeed to come and pay their last respects to Dada in the best way that the Magubanes would.
Good afternoon, um, everybody. Gitunye Awa Makubane to express uh, the heartfelt thanks for all the support that they've received during this time of sorrow. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank the Premier and the President.